the Trail of Tears. That's what we're sucking today. And an overview of the events that led up to the Trail of Tears. Every group of people, every nation that's ever existed in the history of meat sacks for any length of time has been responsible for reprehensible acts. And the Trail of Tears is one of those acts for the United States. At the beginning of the 1830s, nearly 125,000 various tribal members lived on millions of acres of land in Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, North Carolina, and Florida, land where their ancestors had lived for generations. By the end of that decade, very few indigenous Americans remained anywhere in the southeastern United States. The federal government forced them to leave their homelands and walk hundreds of miles, sometimes thousands of miles, to a specially designated Indian territory across the Mississippi River, present-day Oklahoma. And this difficult and deadly journey, thousands would die along the way, would be known as the Trail of Tears. Not only is it a terrible event to look back on, many people at the time knew it was a terrible event, but it happened anyway. As new waves of European settlers kept pouring into America, farming land along the coast was quickly taken up. Farming land for growing cotton in Georgia, Alabama, North Carolina, Florida, and Tennessee was especially coveted. New settlers wanted that land, and they would do almost anything to get it, including taking it from tribe members who, yes, had lost their battles against the U.S. government, but also could have been treated far more fairly in the aftermath. Rather than work to assimilate the tribes into American culture, the U.S. federal government, under President Andrew Jackson and his Indian Removal Act, passed by Congress in 1830, chose to banish them to less desirable land. Though the entire process of Indian removal that lasted from 1831 to 1877 would come to be known as the Trail of Tears, one march in particular would become emblematic of the entire misguided and heartless venture. The 2,200-mile, 1838 journey of 17 Cherokee detachments who were marched by gunpoint to their new homes in the freshly dubbed Indian Territory. Historians estimate that between a quarter and a third of what remained of the Cherokee population died during that journey. Today's topic is a dark one. An historical event doesn't get called the Trail of Tears because there's a happy ending. And it's a fascinating one with some information in it that might surprise you. Like the tribes that marched having slaves, their slaves often march alongside them. I don't remember that from history class. Stick around all the way to the end for that info. A lot of interesting history coming your way in today's. It didn't have to be this way. Why can't we work together and not against each other? Let's not do this again edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald and you're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Welcome to the Cult of the Curious. Welcome back for many of you. I'm Dan Cummins, the Suck Master, Suck Nasty, Carl Denke's Pickled Pork Apprentice, Bad Magician Camp Coordinator. You are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, you're the best, Lucifina. Praise Bojangles and safe out there on the seven seas, Yacht Rock Pioneer Michael Motherfucking McDonald, a.k.a. Triple M. When are you going to get in the studio with uh, Steve Winwood? We want to see that happen. Uh, last reminder that thanks to our Patreon supporters, Bad Magic Productions was able to donate $13,000, $13,800 to the May 2021 Charity of the Month, the Ocular Melanoma Foundation. To find out more, go to ocularmelanoma.org. Full list of charities we've donated to is on the TimeSuck app, the app that will be the Bad Magic app before long, donated over $206,000 to charity so far. We're all very excited about that. Uh, Thanks to those of you who have bought tickets for something else we're excited about. The June 10th, Thursday night, Is We Dumb live and uncensored show. Going to be hosted at loopedlive.com. Joe and I have got some very weird plans for that one. Virtual doors open at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Show starts at 6.30. Uh, Dog the Bounty Hunter. (laughs) Sorry, I I just say it automatically. Dog the Bounty Hacker. (laughs) Not Hunter. Dr. Bounty Hacker, Jigsaw Puzzle in a tin storage box in the store at badmagicmerch.com. Not kidding. We, we've really made it. 252 pieces, 11 by 14 inches in size. Why do we have a Dog the Bounty Hacker Jigsaw Puzzle? Well, because it amuses us. Why does it amuse us? I don't know. Uh, we're insane. Uh, love that many of you have downloaded the free subgroup social pack from badmagicmerch.com out there forming new community groups to make it that much harder for Zuck to destroy the suck. A uh, new Cult of the Curious Musicians Facebook group I saw just formed. Maybe you can hop in there, find somebody to jam with. It's a public group. Also new, the Cult of the Curious Commune private Facebook group. That's out there now. A group for homesteaders, farmers, gardeners, and preppers. Uh, within the cult, sharing ideas and success stories, asking for advice and sharing knowledge in Nimrod. I love it. Fuck yeah. Find your people. Find your tribe. Hail Nimrod. Uh, and now, that's it. That's it for announcements. Just a couple fun ones. 
And now we're moving on. We're going to get into a subject that's come up a lot on the voting boards of the Time Suck website and app, but has never received a proper suck of its own. We mentioned the Trail of Tears in September of 2018 when we dug into a discussion of 7th U.S. President Andrew motherfucking Jackson. Also mentioned it during our Navajo Code Talker suck back in January. And I'm sure it's been mentioned in some other sucks here and there. And now today we open wide and suck it fully. And the Trail of Tears is well worth fully sucking. Those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. It would be nice not to repeat this one. Uh, if you don't listen to The Secret Suck, then you don't know how close The Trail of Tears has come before to being a Monday topic, like over and over again, for like a year and a half, maybe two years. The handsome, beautiful, intelligent, courageous, well-endowed, perfect-breasted, perfect-pecked, perfect whatever they want to have be perfect space lizards over on Patreon, vote via the Time Suck app or website twice a month to pick two topics for, the, for an upcoming month. And the Trail of Tears has almost won about 10 different times in the past two years. And it made it into the top five out of literally thousands of potential topics, what feels like around 20 times. Not kidding. No topic has been voted for over and over and over and just never quite won like this one. Excited to finally suck it. I uh, hope to make it worth the wait for the space or to have uh, really wanted me to give uh, my take on this, on this topic. I learned a lot on this one. Hope you will too. <laughs> Let's get into it. Uh, the Trail of Tears was a major historical event most associated with the year 1838 and Cherokee nations. But that wasn't the only year of a major forced migration west. And the Cherokee weren't the only ones forced to march. Some historians consider the Trail of Tears to be a massive series of forced displacements that began back in 1831, not long after that Indian Removal Act of 1830, lasted all the way until 1877. The Trail of Tears is really many, many different migrations that occurred over several decades, forced marches that changed the destinies of many of America's southeastern indigenous tribes. It's a huge subject. We'll do our best to tell, you know, the, the meat of it, the gist of it, in about two hours. The Trail of Tears followed the Indian Removal Act of 1830, as I said. It resulted in thousands of people needlessly suffering from exposure, disease, and starvation. More than 10,000 in total would die before reaching their various destinations in all those years. Uh, super dark chapter in U.S. history. On uh, today's suck, we'll meet numerous tribes. We'll focus on just five. The five southeastern uh, you know, American Indian nations known condescendingly in the 19th century as the five civilized tribes. And these five tribes, uh, really five nations, uh, were the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole. They were known as the five civilized tribes because many of them, to different degrees, had embraced learning English, American economic practices like individual ownership of land, and conversion to Christianity. You know, because you're, you're not civilized unless you worship the same God. Everybody knows that. Uh, pretty sad that that used to be a prevailing notion. You know, now, of course, you can be civilized and religious. Not saying that. Uh, not saying you can't, but you can certainly also be civilized and not religious. You can be civilized and spiritual. A lot, of, a lot of civilized atheists out there. I guess you know that, but a few hundred years ago, that notion was preposterous, outlandish to many. A lot of people assume that if you didn't have the Bible or the Quran or the Talmud or something to guide you, you just, I don't know, start fucking dogs in the street, smashing babies in the heads with rocks or something. Just go full evil immediately. Actually, I still meet people who don't seem to understand or believe that you can be both moral and also not religious. It always weirds me out. That some seem to believe that, you know, if they weren't worried about God punishing them, they would just be so fucking wicked. It's like, they just want to be so wicked. That's like the one thing stopping them. Uh, I don't worry about God punishing me. I also don't want to be a piece of shit. I don't need fear or the hope of being rewarded later to keep me from being a savage. And neither did many of the tribes. Uh, anyways, when we, when, when the five civilized tribes did embrace Christianity, spoke English, and embraced other American political principles and cultural values, a lot of them were still forced to leave their lands so that more white settlers could move in. Uh, forced removal by the U.S. government looked different to each of these indigenous nations. Three of them agreed to move away, although you know uh, there was differing degrees of dissent, and two of the tribes decided to fight back. One via the U.S. court system, one in all-out bloody warfare. And look, before I go further, of course things were going to be messy between white settlers and indigenous Americans to some degree. No hostile takeover of one group of people by another is ever going to not be messy. This is not going to be some, you know, apologist dissertation about how evil early Americans were to take native land. You know, if that makes them evil, then I guess every conqueror who has ever lived has been evil. And every group of people, not just the white man, since there have been, you know, conquerors within every group of people I've ever studied are all evil. I don't think the European settlement of America was inherently evil. I don't think taking land was inherently evil. It's just, that's what conquering is. I, I just think the way it was done was problematic. 
I think at various moments, it was needlessly evil and entirely unnecessary. Conquered people don't need to be abused and disrespected in the variety of ways the tribes were after they had been conquered. The Trail of Tears went down the way it did because European settlers did not view indigenous Americans as their equals. They didn't see them as worthy adversaries. They often viewed them the same way they viewed, you know, Pacific Islanders or Africans. They saw their fellow meat sacks as subhuman savages. And that is how the evil treatment snuck in. The Trail of Tears happened in large part for the same reasons that Hitler's final solution happened or American plantation slavery happened. You can do all kinds of evil shit to your fellow meat sack if you dehumanize them enough, if you viewed them as less than. So much evil has been carried out when others have been dehumanized. Uh, the whole concept of reservations uh, is, in, in my opinion, partially based in this view, right? They can't possibly blend in. Those savages need to live somewhere else away from us civilized folk. So what should have been done instead, instead of, uh, you know, forcing everybody to march to these reservations, I think in a better world than the one we meet sacks have historically lived in, in a world where others different from ourselves are not dehumanized and judged based on skin color or cultural differences, the tribes could have been much more respectfully encouraged to become full U.S. citizens, right? What if they hadn't been forced to adopt a new God? What if they uh, didn't have to adopt all the new customs? What if they had to change, but not so much? Like when you're conquered, I understand you have to assimilate, you have to let go of some shit. You know, in this case, they should have had to adopt individual land ownership. That's how our economy works. They should have had to uh, salute our flag. They needed to learn the official language, the language of commerce, English. They should have been encouraged to send their kids to the same schools as the whites, or at least educate them in ways mandated by the state. You got to learn the new ways of the conquering people who've come in and changed things. Get that. But they also could have been allowed to hold on to many of their customs, have tribal community centers, just like white settlers had churches. They should have been allowed to keep their cultures alive alongside the white settlers who brought aspects of their various European cultures with them. There's room for everybody, you know, still live on the same lands, but now maybe as homesteaders or as shopkeepers, mill workers, mill owners, et cetera, living in, you know, uh, homes and cities plotted and planned by a new government. You have to integrate. I get that, but not in a way that involves cultural death. That's just cruel and unnecessary. You know, if you pledge allegiance to the new flag, then you should be treated like any other citizen and afforded the same rights. But that deal was not offered to the tribes because of xenophobia and racism. Of course, that deal was not going to be offered by a nation that still condoned slavery. But in a better world, how great it would have been if that could have happened, right? Some detractors will say, I imagine that the tribes uh, would not have wanted to do that, what I just laid out in rough terms. And I imagine they would not have. But when you lose a war, well, you just don't get everything you want. And if you refuse a deal like that, then I think it's fair to punish you. I get that. Hundreds of tribes having their land taken is sad. You bet it is, but it was inevitable. What was not inevitable was how it was done, how tribes were treated after being conquered. Chiefs could have been made mayors or governors in places where whites and others also lived instead of being banished to segregated reservations. They could have been shown some, you know, some fucking respect. Sorry, I know that was long-winded. I just don't like, before I get into this, I don't like uh, the, the two ways the story of what led to the Trail of Tears tends to be told in my opinion. The first way is that, you know, the white man had no right to kick the tribes off their land. To me, that view shows a lack of understanding of what always happens when people are conquered. Uh, And the other way is, well, if they just would have made more of an effort to accept defeat and would have uh, just assimilated, they would have never have had to have been marched. And that view shows, I think, a lack of understanding of how dismissive of their culture white settlers in the U.S. government, you know, were. And even when they did try to assimilate, they were still kicked out. Uh, You know, they, they weren't really given a fair chance to blend in. They were asked to totally abandon all of their traditions, cut their hair, change their, the way they dressed, you know, change everything, and, and then they were still told they were inferior. Uh, land of the free my ass with that kind of attitude. You know, they were welcomed to a uh, land of the act like uh, we want or, you know, fuck you. And even when you do act the way we want, still kind of fuck you. Too much. Okay, just had to get that out early. Uh, one of the meat sacks most behind wanting them to change everything, a man who saw them primarily as savages, was Andrew Jackson, seventh president of the U.S., Focus of episode 106 back in September of 2018. And Jackson's legacy is a complicated one, as we discussed back in 2018. Uh, He's considered by many to be the father of American-style democracy, the first president we had that was born to immigrant parents, the first president that was not part of a political dynasty from Massachusetts or Virginia, a war hero that helped keep America free from foreign rule with his War of 1812 victory in the Battle of New Orleans. And he was a war hero. He did help save America, you know, from British control. Can't take that away from him. He also is hated by many. He was arguably the greatest enemy to the tribes in all of U.S. history, something that makes him unpopular to many now and something that made him extremely popular in his time to many. But Jackson had, uh, you know, he also adopted a Creek orphan child, uh, Lincoya, raised him as his son. So clearly he didn't outright hate all of them. I think he just found their way of life inferior, maybe more than that, maybe despised their way of life. Uh, He raised a Creek orphan, but not in the ways of the Creek, not at all. He raised them in the ways of the white man. 
Uh, his relationship with the tribe's complicated. And in general, to be honest, pretty shitty. Uh, he's a more complicated historical figure than most. He did some really great things and some really terrible things. We'll go over his hand in passing the Indian Removal Act that led to the Trail of Tears and more in the timeline. It'll be a big timeline, covering America's initial encounters with American Indians, especially the five civilized tribes, and how the U.S. continually displaced them. Uh, that'll take up the majority of today's suck. Before we get into all that, we're going to meet these five tribes. Uh, nothing too in-depth here. Just a quick intro to each. Uh, as I said, the five tribes were the Cherokee, Muscogee, uh, or Creek. Uh, I'll, I'll usually call them Creek, Cherokee, Creek, Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Seminole. First up, Cherokee. The tribe most synonymous with the Trail of Tears. They would be the ones to suffer the most during the most infamous Trail of Tears march in 1838. They were one of the largest tribes when Europeans began con con ah, colonizing. I wanted to switch the N and the L there. Colonizing. What would that be? Uh, when Europeans began colonizing the Americas, the term Cherokee comes from a Creek slash uh, Muscogee tribal word meaning people of different speech. Historians estimate that in 1650, the Cherokee numbered around 22,500 people, occupying about 40,000 square miles of Appalachian Mountains and parts of present day Georgia, eastern Tennessee, western parts of present day North Carolina and South Carolina. Their numbers declined leading up to the Trail of Tears. Roughly 16,000 would be forcibly displaced. The Cherokee Nation was composed of a confederacy of symbolically red meaning warring and white meaning peaceful villages. Each village had two governments, white government and red government, one for war, one for peace. The war chiefs of the red councils were subordinated to a supreme warring chief, while the peace chiefs of the white councils were under the rule of a supreme peaceful chief. The white government was in power primarily beginning with spring planting season, maintained control over domestic affairs, they made decisions that guided the tribe during times of peace, including domestic issues and ceremonies. In the fall, which is considered the time of war, uh, duties then generally fell on the red government. They were in charge of declaring and carrying out war when they felt the circumstances made it necessary. Basically, from what I can gather, the white government ruled for the most part until there was a problem of some kind. And then the red government would step in and be like, hey, peace chiefs, why don't you go sit at the kiddies table? Chief problems get killed and chief, let's put some fucking arrows in some fucking heads. They're in charge now. Uh, I bet sometimes the war chiefs and the peace chiefs hated each other, right? Oh, of course, Chief Hatchet Hawk wants to lead another raiding party. Oh, I'm Chief Hatchet Hawk. I'm so dumb. Look at me. Look at my big muscles and my tiny brain. I can throw a hatchet, but I'm dumb and can barely put on my own moccasins. And then Chief Hatchet Hawk would walk up. Fuck you to say, Chief sits with butterflies? You talking shit? Chief thinks he can wish attackers away? Chief defends his tribe with dandelions and dreams? Don't you open a can of whoop ass. You can't close. Uh, the Cherokee people, red, white, everyone. They used a variety of tools before Europeans showed up, including knives, axes, and chisels. They wove baskets, made pottery, they cultivated corn, beans, and squash. For meat and clothing, the Cherokee hunted deer, bear, elk, wild turkeys, and other small game, and also fished. Uh, they lived in wattle and daub log homes with roofs made out of bark. A hole in the bark would let out smoke and allow them to cook inside and stay warm. A typical Cherokee town had between 30 and 60 homes, along with a council house, where members would meet for general meetings and, a sacred, and keep a sacred fire burning. Uh, they had complex rituals and spiritual ceremonies like the annual Busk Festival, sometimes known as the Green Corn Festival, which celebrated the lighting of new ceremonial fires and the ripening of crops in late summer. An important aspect of a traditional Busk Festival was Cherokees forgiving one another for, e for every wrongdoing, grievance, or crime that had occurred the past year, except for murder. That's interesting to me. I wonder if anyone abused that system. Somebody had to have, right? Some asshole every year. And like the week, maybe two weeks leading up to that festival, just does so much shady shit, knowing that they're going to be forgiven, right? Just cheats on his wife, eats all the best food in the village, takes a shit in a few different people's moccasins, you know, and then just hides out in the woods, shows up again at the festival. Ah, come on, come on, come on, don't be mad. Ah, hey, hey, oh, easy, easy. Don't throw that punch. It's a green corn festival. Water under the bridge now. It's a new year now. And they're like, fuck you, runs with weasels. I'm going to catch your ass next year. Cherokee first encountered Europeans way back in 1540 when a Spanish expedition led by Hernando de Soto passed through present-day Tennessee. More on de Soto later in the timeline. Interesting character. Uh, the Cherokee would begin to encounter uh, the British a little over a century later in Virginia. During the age of colonization, the Spanish, French, English all attempted to colonize parts of the Southeast, which included Cherokee territory. In the mid-18th century, the Cherokee allied with the British in the French and Indian War and other European conflicts in the New World. Uh, the Cherokee then allied allied with British again during the American Revolution, which did not work out well for them. The British would actually destroy numerous Cherokee towns and some scorched earth retreat tactics, and then American forces would conduct a series of massacres destroying numerous towns as well. 
And when the British lost the war, the Cherokee were unable to effectively fight the Americans on their own. By the end of the war, their power was broken, much of their crops and villages destroyed, and their warriors scattered across the Southeast. After ceding some of their lands to North Carolina, they generally assimilated with other Ameri or with American colonists, at least tried to. Many of them adopted colonial methods of farming, weaving, home building. In 1821, uh, Sequoia, a Cherokee who'd served in the U.S. Army during the Creek War, wrote a, oh boy, I have this uh, pronunciation, uh, syllabary. I'll get this word right later on. Because I know I put it <laughs> next to most instances of the word. Uh, I think it's a syllabary. Of course, I would fuck that word up. Uh, uh, it's a system of writing which each symbol represents a syllable. It was so successful that almost the entire tribe became literate in a short time. So this is the first time somebody had formed the uh, written language for the Cherokee, Cherokee Nation. And it led to a Cherokee constitution being written, uh, a Cherokee newspaper that began being printed in 1828. We'll, we'll learn a few more details about the Cherokee in the timeline. Right now, let's meet their neighbors, the Creeks also called the Muscogee. The Creek tribe who spoke Muscogean originally occupied a huge expanse of the flatlands in present-day Georgia and Alabama. There were two divisions of Creeks, the Muscogee or Upper Creeks, who occupied the Northern Creek Territory and the Lower Creeks, composed of the uh, Hitchiti and Alabama, who had the same general traditions as the Upper Creeks but spoke a slightly different dialect. Uh, the Creek economy was based largely on the cultivation of corn, beans, and squash, most of the farming was done by women, while the men were responsible for hunting and defense. The Creek achieved status based on individual merit, rather than by inheriting it, which was different than a lot of tribes. Noites! No riding Papa's coattails into any kind of unearned tribal respect. I like it. Half-ass hunts and his brother sleeps through the noon sun. Don't get to be chief just because their dad is chief hunts bears with his wits and hard dick. Creek towns were also symbolically grouped into white and red categories set apart for peace ceremonies and war ceremonies, respectively, very similar to the Cherokee. Each town had a plaza or community square where their town would gather for important ceremonies with houses made out of poles plastered with mud surrounding them. The roofs were pitched and covered with either bark or thatch with holes for smoke. If the town had a temple for spiritual ceremonies, it was a thatched dome-shaped structure set on an eight-foot mound. Stairs on the mound led to the temple door. The Creek and other tribes weren't religious in the sense we think a lot of religions today. Uh, no ancient texts, no real dogma, but they did have spiritual beliefs, like most tribes, uh, if not basically all of them. Uh, the Creek believed that we meet sex have two souls, the first being a good spirit that follows us through life and talks to us in our dreams. That spirit thought to live in our head. And there was a second dark spirit that lived in one's entrails. Sentiments, passions, feelings of good and evil said to come from the, uh, the old entrail spirit. Thought, planning, and devising come from the good spirit. The second spirit does not leave one until after a person's death, and then only your good spirit remains. You know, your, your soul is pure. Uh, the Creek's first contact with the Europeans occurred in 1538 when Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto uh, arrived in Creek territory before he made it further along and met the Cherokees. De Soto and the Creeks would do battle. De Soto would do so much battling. He was a battling son of a bitch. Gonna have to suck that conquistador someday. Later, English new newcomers from South Carolina would meet the Creeks and start trading with them and sometimes enslaving them in the 1670s. Some Creek tribes, there were many, would later ally themselves with the British, fighting mostly against the Appalachian tribe and the Spanish. And many Creek took slaves from the people they would beat in battles like another tribe we'll meet in a few minutes. Uh, during the 18th century, the two largest groups of Creeks organized into the Creek Confederacy to present a united front against their enemies, both American, Indian, and white. For their alliance, Creeks recruited speakers of other Muscogean languages, including the Hachiti, as well as speakers of, the, of some non-Muscogean languages like the Yuchi, as well as some Natchez and Shawnee. We're not sure how many Creek were there when Europeans showed up. Smallpox decimated an untold number of them before the U.S. was a nation yet, long before, uh, back before anyone was trying to get an idea as to how, how big they were. It's estimated that the population of the Creek Nation in the 1860s, or I'm sorry, in the 1680s, was 9,000 rising to 20,000 during the Revolutionary War and to about 22,000 by 1830, shortly before the Trail of Tears era. Next up, the Chickasaw. I like that name, Chickasaw. They were a tribe of great hunters and warriors whose towns were located near the headwaters of the Tombigbee River in northeastern Mississippi. Semi-nomadic Chickasaw ranged far and wide over the whole of the Mississippi River Valley. The Chickasaw were much less numerous than the Cherokee and Choctaw, only about 5,000 of them in 1600, but they were strong, they claimed vast hunting grounds in western Kentucky and Tennessee and northern Alabama and Mississippi. The Chickasaw were divided into two uh, moieties or divisions, which in turn divided into numerous clans. A person's clan was inherited from their mother. They were forbidden to marry within that clan. All right, no cousin fucking. That was basically their extended family was their, was their clan. Uh, the head chief was aided by a council of advisors from various clans, elders, 
There were also two head priests who helped provide leadership. The priests presided at religious ceremonies and helped the tribe interpret life in spiritual terms. And the Chickasaw also took slaves like the Creek. Uh, they took them similar to many African tribes from centuries past, from tribes they'd conquered in battle. The slaves would then help with agricultural work and various other chores. Members of all five of these civilized tribes would actually participate in some form of slavery, actually. Uh, by 1860, there were 4,000 enslaved African Americans living in the Cherokee Nation alone. I should make it clear that, uh, you know, just because the the tribes would be victimized in the Trail of Tears marches uh, later on, that doesn't mean that they, you know, didn't do plenty of fucked up shit themselves. No culture is perfect. We all commit very sins. Uh, during wartime, the Chickasaw built towns that were grouped closely together, but in peacetime, settlements popped up whenever, wherever the Chickasaw ranged. Chickasaw towns had central meeting houses, squares for ceremonies. Traditionally, each family had a summer house, winter house, and storage buildings for corn and other supplies. The women collected wild strawberries, persimmons, nuts, acorns, honey, and onions. They dried grapes and plums to make raisins, prunes, made tea from sassafras root. Chickasaw men uh, painted their faces for ceremonies and battles. They shaved the sides of their heads, also soaked their, their skin in with bear grease. Good old bear grease. DeSoto wrote a lot about bear grease, encountering a lot of it during his mid-16th century North American expedition. I, I, don't, I don't remember ever hearing about bear grease before this sucks. Some people still use bear grease, aka bear fat, for treating skin conditions or randomly to grow facial hair or to grow back hair lost like male pattern baldness. It was actually commonly used as medicine for dry skin and to grow hair uh, from who knows how long ago, written records weren't kept until the First World War. And you can still find a few people today who claim it will grow your hair back or fix some rash you have. They still sell it on the web, even on Amazon. How weird, right? I had no idea there was a bear grease market out there. Uh, it's also used as a type of beard oil or pomade. The Chickasaw used it to make their hair shinier or to mix with clay, make a type of paint or to try and grow, you know, some hair back. <laughs> it's so weird to me. I picture some poor Chickasaw warrior. Like he's going bald, you know, just that they don't understand. No one understood yet. Like male pattern baldness. And he's just rubbing so much fucking bear grease on his head every day, several times a day. In this sad failed attempt to, you know, get his hair to grow back. So <laughs> now, now his, now his bald head that he's already self-conscious about is fucking so shiny, so greasy, so much bear fat rubbed on it. Just continually rubbing more and more, just drawing more and more attention to the part of his body's, you know, most self-conscious about all the villagers, you know, feel bad for him. They're encouraging him. Don't, don't give up, head, head that shines like sun. <laughs> It'll still work. He's got to put more bear grease on it. I picture like two inches of bear grease on this son of a bitch's head. <laughs> Pine needles, like dirt bugs and shit all stuck in it. You're doing great, head that shines like sun. <laughs> Finally, he snaps. I shut the fuck up. Hollow words pour from pie hole. It's been five years. I'm sick of having a greasy head. Have you, se have you seen my pillow? It's, it's, look at it. Look at that grease. It's like sleeping inside a dead bear. All I ever smell now is bare fat. All I, all I taste is bare fat. My bald head constantly covered in pimples. Enough. Uh, enough about bear grease. Uh, the Chickasaw men wore something called a, a breech clout, which is a long rectangular piece of tanned deer skin, cloth, or animal fur worn between the legs, tucked over a belt so that the flaps fall down in front and behind. In colder weather, they added deer skin shirts and bear skin robes, as well as deer skin boots for hunting. Man, it must have sucked back then to run around. You know, compared to now with no proper underwear. You ever think about that? Fucking balls just bounce around all the time. I wonder how many dudes, like how often dudes just sat on their balls back then. I think about that. You got no tight underwear, get no jock straps holding them in place, keeping that chaos controlled. You ever sat on your balls? It fucking, it, my God, it hurts. It'll put a damper on your day real quick. I talked to Joe Paisley about this and he wondered if maybe the Chickasaw dude's balls got calloused eventually from just bouncing around and being sat on so much. And then it wouldn't hurt so much because he's got a couple, you know, rock hard balls. Those are the kind of top shelf intellectual discussions we have here at the Suck Dungeon. Enough about hard balls. Uh, Chickasaw women wore dresses, made tanned deer skin, and wore their long hair tied up. And they didn't have to worry about their hard balls. What about their boobs? Ever think about that? What if some of them had huge boobs? I'm sure some did. And then no bras to support them. And they're just fucking flopping around if they have to run anywhere. You know, did that fuck their backs up? Maybe. Did they stretch their boobs out so far that they sat on their boobs sometimes? How much would that hurt? A lot of, lot of hard hitting questions being pondered right now. Uh, after driving away Hernando de Soto in the winter of 1540, 1541, we'll talk about that in the timeline. They got into it. Uh, the Chickasaw managed to avoid European contact for the next hundred years or so. That would end in the late 17th century when English traders began working their way into the Mississippi Valley with their cotton cloth, metal tools, knives, guns, iron pots, and other goods. 
doing a lot of trading. The Chickasaw traded with the English, became more dependent on their goods. The tribe widened its hunting grounds to get more and more skins to trade back, resulting in a war with the Choctaw over resources and other tribes. To make things more chaotic, the French were moving north from the Gulf of Mexico, trying to establish their control over the Mississippi Valley. They wanted those furs. For the next 60 years, the British and the Chickasaw fought the French and their Indian American allies, with the uh, Chickasaw usually winning, but the winds would take their toll. A lot of warriors were lost in battle. By the late 18th century, the Chickasaw were caught then between the Americans and the Spanish. When the U.S. purchased the Louisiana Territory and Spain ceded Florida, it became clear that a scenario where the Chickasaw played the co colonizing powers off of one another was not going to lead to any sort of Chickasaw independence. They knew they would soon have to deal with the Americans. Two more big nations now, starting with the Choctaw. Uh, the Choctaw Indian nation traces its ancestry to Mississippi, some sections of Alabama. According to folk legend, the Choctaw people originated from a sacred hill near present-day Noxapater, Mississippi. Oh, these, all these interesting names down there. Noxapater, Mississippi. That's a mouthful. Uh, their sacred hill is often referred to as the Mother Mound. And in the mid-18th century, there were around 20,000 Choctaw living in 60 or 70 settlements along the Pearl. Oh, this is the Chicka, Chickasahay and Pascagoula Rivers. <laughs> we, don't have a, we don't have a lot of rivers like name things like that around here. We have like Salmon, Snake. Clearwater, down in the south. Pascagoula, Chickasaw Highway. Uh, their, their dwellings were thatched roof cabins made of logs plastered over with mud. Among the southeastern tribes, Choctaw were the most skillful farmers. Uh, they regularly produced surplus crops. They sold and traded with European settlers. Arguably the most famous Choctaw was Pushmataha, a war chief who negotiated treaties with the U.S. government, fought for the Americans in the War of 1812. His full name uh, again, Pushmataha means his arm and all the weapons in his hands are fatal to his foes. Fuck yeah! That's a name. That's a badass name. That dude was like the Chuck Norris of the Choctaw. The Alexander Superkiller Solonik of the Choctaw. How much would it suck to be Chief uh, Pushmataha's little brother? Right? Like if you just weren't good at fighting, you end up with a name that means something like his arms are like thin blades of grass. And weapons are not the most effective due to his weak little baby doll hands. They annoy, but do not really concern his foes. <laughs> That'd suck. Uh, Chief Pushmataha was also a powerful speaker. U.S. General Sam Dale, who heard Pushmataha when he served under General Andrew Jackson in the Creek War of 1813-1814, declared him to be the greatest orator he had ever heard. Culturally, the Choctaws have always honored their women as the head of every family household. Uh, they also played America's oldest field, sp field sport, stickball. Stickball was often used between various tribes as an alternative to war when settling disputes. The modern sport of lacrosse evolved out of stickball. Uh, the Choctaw, along with a few other nations, including Navajo, would also serve in the U.S. Army as code talkers in World War I and World War II. Check out Suck 225 for more on that. And last up, the Seminole, the first of the five tribes to meet Europeans at the beginning of the 16th century. Like a lot of these widely defined tribes that are actually, uh, that are actually nations, the, the Seminole Indians are actually a union of several tribes from southeastern U.S. Seminole history began when bands of Creek Indians from Georgia and Alabama migrated to Florida in the 1700s, fleeing conflict with Europeans and other tribes. For a while, Spain encouraged these migrations as a way of building a buffer between Spanish Florida and the British colonies. The Spanish would supply the Seminole with weapons to help them fight the British. In addition to Creek, Seminoles included Uchis, uh, Yamasee, and other indigenous groups. Seminole communities also included escaped or freed slaves called Black Seminoles, who initially paid the tribes for protection and then assimilated and married into the tribes. The name Seminole originates from a Spanish word, uh, Cimarron, meaning wild one slash wild people or runaway. Today, the Seminole are well known for their beautiful wood carvings, beadwork, and woven baskets. Traditional Seminole clothing was very simple, uh, fairly simple, excuse me. Mo men generally wore uh, breech cloths and women wore, wore wraparound skirts made from palmetto. During the hotter months, the Seminole typically didn't wear shirts. In the colder months, they wore uh, woven ponchos. Gotta get, gotta get Lindsay to wear uh, some wraparound palmetto skirts. Hail Lucifina! Uh, like other southeastern tribes, their crops included corn, squash, and beans. They hunted deer, rabbits, wild turkeys, other small game primarily. And uh, as they migrated southward into the Everglades to avoid white settlers, the Seminole encountered alligators. And over many, many years, incredibly, uh, these fucking tough people learned to tame and ride the Fatwixley a seminal word that translates roughly to swamp horse. How fucking cool is that? Super shocking for white settlers when they first saw the Seminole riding their swamp horses, the Fatwixley, down slow-moving rivers and bayous. Yeah, I bet it was. Uh, the best Seminole warriors were even able to train their alligator swamp horses to carry them on land as well. Not as fast as a horse, but like way faster than you might think. 
The warriors would sit on them, just legs crisscrossed. They would they could balance and control their bodies so well, they could effectively shoot arrows off the backs of these alligators, these swamp horses. I highly recommend you go to YouTube. Look up some videos of Seminoles riding their alligator swamp horses. For Twixly is the best way to search it. Uh, it's just F-U-H-T-W-I-X-L-E-E. You know, actually pause this episode right now. Just look, this, this is incredible. Okay, did any of you find those videos? If you did, please send me a link. I'm having a hard time finding them myself because I just fucking made all that up. No one can ride gators as horses. Not really. Uh, there are some alligator tra- <laughs> trainers who I've seen video of who will, they will sit on one for a little while with another person kind of helping beside them, but they look nervous as fuck. They have to hold the alligator's mouth closed with their with both their hands, you know, and they, and they bail after a few feet because you know, they're gators. Swamp horses, sadly not real. Uh, what I should have said earlier was as they migrated southward into the Everglades to avoid white settlers, they began building their houses on three foot tall stilts that protected them from swamp animals and floods. In battle, the Seminoles' main weapons were bows and tomahawks. God, I wish that they shot arrows off the backs of gators. War gators! My own lie. <laughs> it's making me sad that it's not true right now. God, I wish swamp, swamp gators, like swamp horses were real. Ah, uh, gator steeds. In the 1700s, as they traded with European settlers, the Seminoles started using guns. The Green Corn Dance, we mentioned the Green Corn Festival earlier. Uh, the most important ceremony in Seminole co- culture. At this ceremony, the tribe stomp dances for hours to express gratitude to the creator for providing them with food. Today, there are two Seminole tribes, the Florida Seminoles and the Oklahoma Seminoles. Each tribe has its own laws and government. Seminoles of Florida call themselves the unconquered people, descendants of just roughly 300 tribal members who managed to elude capture by the U.S. Army in the 19th century for many decades. All right, now let's dig into how European settlers who morphed into Americans when the U.S. was formed interacted with these five tribes or nations and others as more citizens looked to settle more and more land. All this stuff led to the Trail of Tears in today's Time Suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Starting way back, 1510, the year that the uh, first recorded meeting happened between Europeans and the Seminole, when a Spanish slave ship landed in southern Florida. Three years later, in 1513, the Spanish crown claims the eastern U.S. and calls it La Florida, meaning full of flowers. Ponce de Leon was the Spaniard, uh, Spaniard, who came up with that name on the, on the expedition he led to explore different points along the modern state of Florida's coast. Uh, he is the guy associated with the Fountain of Youth legend. At quick glance, it appears that he never did search for any such thing. I'd have to suck him, find out for sure, one of these days. Uh, maybe he's the real trainer of swamp horses. Maybe he's the man who rode across Florida on a gator steed. Ride that ferocious swamp horse, Ponce de Leon. Ride like the wind. Hail Nimrod. Good luck to you. Ponce would return to Florida in 1521 and encounter a different tribe, the Calusa tribe, who would wound him badly with an arrow. He and his men would quickly retreat. Uh, 1528, conquistador, uh, Pamfila, uh, oh man, Pamfila, Navar- Na- oh my gosh, Navareth. I have a pronunciation guide, but I just, his name is just, it's like slightly different from words I want to say. Uh, this guy, Pamfila uh, de Navareth, would make it to the area of present-day Tampa, Florida with a crew of roughly 400 men. Soon after landing, he decided to split his men up. He took uh, 300 of them on a journey over land while instructing the other, instructing the other 100 men uh, to remain with the ships. And the Denav- uh, journey did not go well. He and his men ended up encountering and fighting Appalachian tribes along their march inland. How fucking crazy to wander into the jungle having no idea what civilization you might encounter just at any second. Like, just n- no clue. Not knowing of some huge group of warriors it's just up around the bend, just ready to beat you and all your men to death. Uh, by the end of July, the expedition reached the area near modern-day Tallahassee. At this point, their supplies had gotten extremely low, especially in the form of food. Uh, it brought the men to the brink of starvation. The members of the expedition left behind on the ships did not follow uh, Navareth and the overland forces up the coast, causing them to be effectively stranded with little supplies in a dangerous territory. The stranded men began making makeshift vessels, five in total, that de Navareth uh, wanted to use to reach Mexico. He split his forces between himself and his second command, and they set sail down the coastline of the Gulf of Mexico in September. Things went from bad to worse. The men endured harsh weather conditions and storms throughout the journey, which caused vessels to drift off and disappear along the way. In November, De Navareth was disappeared and was never seen again. Ultimately, only four men out of the 400 survived the expedition and made it back to Mexico City. I'm impressed that four made it back. Uh, From 1539 to 1543, explorer Hernando de Soto explored the southeastern U.S., and he would definitely come into contact with a lot of tribes. 
He and his crew would be the first white settlers many of the southeastern tribes would meet, and the first many of them would battle. De Soto ended up coming across another Spaniard in Florida on his journey, Juan Ortiz. Where the hell did this guy come from? He was one of the 100 crew members left to watch the boats on Navarre's expedition 11 years earlier. He and a few others had been captured by the Uzita tribe. He was the only one to survive, not be executed. So five of that crew of 400 actually lived. And how crazy is that? That the next expedition of Spaniards would find him. Florida is not a little state. What a, and what a wild life Ortiz led, right? He traveled to a completely unknown land with Navarre. Uh, then he gets captured by a tribe full of people neither he nor anyone else he had ever known had ever encountered before. Then he's almost uh, uh, executed, actually, uh, possibly several times. According to a few different accounts of his captivity, he was almost executed by one chief, had his life spared at the last moment because I guess the chief's daughter pled to save him. Something going on there. Uh, he then escaped and lived with another tribe for a while, and he may have been almost executed again, uh, fleeing to a third tribe, <laughs> all while never knowing if he would ever see another Spaniard ever again. He was the only dude who had, you know, not grown up in, in North America where he's living. He didn't know where to find anybody else from his culture. Wild shit. Luckily for Ortiz, DeSoto also started his inland expedition in the Tampa Bay area where uh, Ortiz was still living. DeSoto landed with over 620 men and 220 horses. And super happy to find Ortiz. Ortiz now spoke several different indigenous languages and dialects. And now he'd be able to guide DeSoto's expedition like no one else on earth could. Literally the only dude on earth at that time who spoke Spanish and the languages of several tribes based in present-day Florida. Ortiz then, then went on to uh, recruit, aka kidnap, guides from various tribes along their route. Some were Cherokee, others were Creek. A chain of communication was soon established whereby a guide who had lived in close proximity to another tribal area was able to pass his info and language onto a guide from a neighboring area and on and on. Uh, this definitely reduced the amount of armed conflicts the Spaniards would have with tribes, but it did not eliminate them. DeSoto and his group traveled for years, making their way from Florida through Georgia and South Carolina, traveling for years. So crazy in an unknown land. Uh, traveled all the way to the Appalachian Mountains, then on into Tennessee, facing continued raids and attacks from American Indians as he looked for gold and also for a trade route to China. Ambitious expedition. Uh, DeSoto was an experienced conquistador. He had already helped conquer the Incan people uh, for the Spanish crown six years before down South America, had been handsomely rewarded. In present-day Alabama, DeSoto and his men fought Chief Tuscaloosa, leader of the Mobilian tribe of men and women, thought to be some of the ancestors of the Creek and Choctaw tribes. During a nine-hour encounter, about 200 Spaniards died and 150 more badly wounded. Chief Tuscaloosa lost an estimated two to 6,000 warriors. So many dudes. They just didn't have the steel weapons, horses, and armor the Spaniards had. And his walled city fortress of Mobila was burned to the ground. And there would be more conflicts. In the spring of 1541, DeSoto demanded 200 men as porters from the Chickasaw, and according to some tellings, demanded that the Chickasaw women, quote, service his men. Uh-huh. All this after the Chickasaw had welcomed the Spaniards into one of their villages and fed them. The Chickasaw refused DeSoto's demands. Yeah, were more than a bit insulted, rightfully so. I mean, anyone who you let into your home, and then they're like, hey, uh, I'm going to have to take some of your male, male residents here when I leave, and I'm going to have to fuck some of your women. Okay? That's a terrible guest. It's very rude. Chickasaw then attacked DeSoto and his men during the night. The Spaniards lost 40 to 60 additional men and the remainder of uh, their already limited equipment, lucky not to lose all of their lives. DeSoto's expedition could have been destroyed at this point, but the Chickasaw let them go. Why? Well, traditional Chickasaw warfare strategy was to quickly strike a massive attack on an enemy. Then, after raining down arrows, before the enemy knew what hit him, quickly retreat to safety and, uh, you know, hide out for a while, cuss down on casualties. Get in, get out. And then after regrouping, maybe get back in again. But by the time they tried to get back in again, DeSoto's forces were already gone. They had fled. They got real lucky. Short time later, Ortiz dies. DeSoto's expedition is doomed. So maybe they didn't get that lucky. Now DeSoto has lost his most important guide, over 200 of his men, a lot of their horses, almost all their equipment. And then they'd encounter another tribe in present-day Arkansas, the Tula tribe, only ever documented via this expedition. The Tula were described as the most skilled and dangerous warriors the Spaniards had ever encountered. The trip would then limp along for a few more weeks after a few more men were lost fighting the Tula, and then DeSoto died of a fever on May 21st, 1542, at the age of 46, in a native village somewhere in either Louisiana or Arkansas. Roughly 300 Spaniards would then make it back to Mexico with no gold, having found no passage to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the Spanish colonization of the New World would continue in Florida, uh, but it would be over 20 years before a serious colonization attempt would occur. In September of 1565, the Spaniards established St. Augustine, the first permanent European city in North America, beating the English by 20 years, who'd established Roanoke in 1585. 
The English would make up for lost time, though, establishing Jamestown in 1607, the Plymouth Colony in 1620, the city of Boston in 1630, Colony of Maryland in 1632, and New York in 1664, uh, when they captured from the Dutch. And all of those colonists would encounter tribes, but not getting into those encounters today, since those encounters don't lead directly to the Trail of Tears, and this is already going to be a big episode without that info. In the 1670s, the French join in on the North American colonization trend when they settle Louisiana. Previously, they'd focused most of their colonial efforts on French uh, French Canada, French Canada. I don't know if that's a thing. That's, that's what I want to say now. Uh, having founded Quebec in 1608. On May 17th, 1673, French explorers uh, Louis Joliet and Jacques Marquette began exploring the Mississippi River. In April of 1682, French explorers arrived at the mouth of the Mississippi, plan a cross in a column bearing the arms of the King of France. Almost a half a century later, in 1718, Jean-Baptiste Lemoyne de Bienville, fucking Mr. Long name, uh, commanded a French expedition in Louisiana. He founded the city of New Orleans in homage to the Regent Duke of Orleans. And all this would lead to a lot more conflict. It would become European nation versus European nation, Europeans versus tribe, tribe versus tribe, uh, everyone competing for resources. In 1754, the French and Indian War breaks out. It began over a disagreement uh, over some Skittles. This, uh, somebody ate all the fucking yellow ones, and you know a lot of people like those the most. And you know, fists fist start flying. I wish. Uh, no, it began over a disagreement over uh, whether the Upper Ohio River Valley was a part of the British Empire and therefore open for trade and settlement by Virginians and Pennsylvanians, or part of the French Empire. And the fighting would last until 1763. In this fight, the Cherokee allied with the British, while the French allied with several several Iroquoian tribes, the Cherokees' traditional enemies. The treaty that ended it was the Treaty of Paris, and it gave Britain Canada, as well as all of France's claims east of the Mississippi River. And there's several treaties of Paris, by the way. We're like, I, I thought the Treaty of Paris was the other year. Well, you're probably right. There's a couple, a couple treaties signed over there. Uh, this did not, however, include New Orleans, which France was allowed to retain. The Treaty of Paris placed Florida under the rule of Britain, and uh, the multiple southeastern indigenous tribes that lived there now placed under British rule as well. Uh, but of course, they hadn't agreed to that. And a lot would, you know, not know that. It's not like someone called them up on their cell phones, you know, told them it should have changed. Uh, all, I find that fascinating. The, the, lot, when these lands were like, uh, oh, at this time in history, would change from like the British to the French, to the Americans. There was always like a group of people that were alive during this time that had no idea that ever, they were ever technically ruled by one king they would never met, meet and then later ruled by another king they would never meet. They were just living their lives. Uh, also, the treaty gave many of the tribes what was called the Indian Reserve, a giant piece of land covering much of the present American Midwest, large chunk of central Canada. Decades before the first reservations were established in the U.S., colonial Britain created this vast, quote-unquote, Indian reserve across thousands of miles of its newly expanded territory. And now this is, and this is big. Starting in 1763, no English settlers could legally travel through or acquire land west of the Appalachian Mountains. The new Indian reserve, that massive swath of territory recently gained from France during the French and Indian War, was off limits like this buffer zone and they didn't want their people going into it and a lot of british colonists were pissed like you know what did they just fight for this would help set the stage for the american revolution colonists wanted to expand and now british king george iii had just told them nope tough shit you gotta you gotta work with this land over here and the reserve uh, you know it boxed them into the east coast and the south the existence of a new indian reserve on land that some frontier colonists felt entitled to some had even previously uh, directly purchased understandably fanned tensions between colonists and their government and more bloodshed would quickly follow. Uh, native land starts to be given away, kind of, stolen really, soon afterwards. In 1773, the Cherokee and Creek exchanged portions of their land to relieve debts they owed to white traders. After having been manipulated by these white traders for years, uh, they just didn't understand the white man's economy. They lived off the land and bartered, and now traders are taking advantage of them with the currency they don't quite get, overcharging them, threatening to cut them off from new resources they had now grown accustomed to and dependent on. To pay off their debts, they ceded more than 2 million acres in Georgia through the Treaty of Augusta, signing, you know, uh, treaties written in a language that was not their primary language. In 1775, more land is given away. The Overhill Cherokee are persuaded to sell an enormous tract of land in central Kentucky to the privately owned Transylvania Land Company. Uh, this would be called the Treaty of Sycamore Shoals. Although land sales to private companies violated British law at the time, that law was never enforced and it didn't do shit to stop the white settlers. And they just moved the fuck on in. Uh, as the American Revolution came closer, the Cherokee were convinced that the British were more likely to maintain agreed-upon boundaries than a new government would, so they announced their support for the British crown. Despite British attempts to restrain them, in July 1776, a force of 700 Cherokee under Chief Dragging Canoe, not all the names are going to translate well, 
attacked two U.S. forts in North Carolina, Eaton Station and Fort Watauga. Both assaults failed, and the tribes retreated in disgrace. These raids set off a series of attacks by Cherokee, Creek, and Choctaw on frontier towns. The settlers responded by forming militias in September and October of 1776, waging a small-scale war. By the end of the fighting, Cherokee power was broken, crops and villages destroyed, and their warriors dispersed. They were forced to surrender vast tracts of territory in North and South Carolina at the Treaty of DeWitt's Corner on May 20th, 1777, and then the Treaty of Long Island of Holston on July 20th, 1777. Peace on the border would last then for about two years. Uh, in 1776, the Revolutionary War rages between the American colonists and the British and each side's allies. Uh, we have done a suck on the Revolutionary War. That was back in Suck 147, if you want to hear more. Uh, 1780, with Americans preoccupied with the British elsewhere, the Cherokee warriors again start up their raids. American colonels Arthur Campbell and John Sevier and their forces subdue the Cherokee tribe again. The Second Treaty of Long Island of Holston on July 26, 1781, forces the Cherokee to give up even more territory. In 1783, uh, Britain returns Florida to Spain. Tribes there now have new leaders that many, again, don't fucking know about. Next year, 1784, Alexander McGilvray, a Creek leader, negotiates the Treaty of Pensacola with Spain for Muscogee Creeks. The following year, 1785, would see the first treaty between the Cherokee and the brand new United States, establishing peaceful relations. It was called the Treaty of Hopewell, named for Hopewell, Georgia, and it involved exchanging prisoners on both sides and establishing boundaries for Cherokee hunting grounds in Tennessee and North Carolina. In the treaty's conclusion, the hatchet was said to be forever buried and peace and friendship reestablished. And that, of course, you know, would not be the case. A new line of thinking for the brand new United States would emerge in the late 1780s that the federal government should urge American Indians to abandon their traditional ways of life. They hoped that if, uh, you know, uh, natives learned how to live, worship, and farm like Christian Americans, there would be less conflict. I get the logic. I do. But again, what a shitty decision, right? And so at odds with supposed American ideals. America was supposedly founded on principles big on religious freedom, right? And this goes completely against that. You ever think about stuff like that? You know, let the tribes worship whoever the fuck they want. Religious freedom oftentimes was interpreted as just uh, Christian freedom. So, so much human conflict could be avoided if more motherfuckers weren't so dogmatic and overly tribalistic, right? If more meet them in the middle could go down. The U.S. government now encouraged many tribes to run up debts to traders and government stores. And how were those debts settled? By giving away more land. Uh, life was not terrible for all tribal members, though. Some did choose to adapt to the white man's way. Some thrived in Southern Creek Territory along the border with the Mississippi Territory. Families of mixed Creek and European ancestry established farms and ferries and increasingly created private wealth from communal lands. With changing economies came fundamental changes in the way men and women viewed themselves. Men whose fame and self-worth had previously rested on skills as warriors and hunters in the tribes now became cattle ranchers. Some native women whose responsibilities had always included the production of finished leather for household use as well as trade willingly now took up the loom, started working with cotton. Uh, but there was still the question of the land. Who did the land actually belong to? And as the 19th century began, land-hungry Americans poured into the backcountry of, of the coastal South, began moving toward and into what would later become the states of Alabama and Mississippi, escalating demands for more and more sessions of, of native, uh, escalating demands for more and more sessions of native land earned white people a new name among the Creeks that meant people greedily grasping after the lands of the red people. The U.S. government should have given them the ability to become citizens and homestead their own land, right, own it like the white settlers could, but they didn't. No natives were offered U.S. citizenship until 1831, and even then it would be a small group of Choctaw. Nationally, citizenship would not be offered to the tribes until 1924. It's insane. Tensions began, uh, or tensions between white settlers and tribes would keep mounting uh, headed into the 19th century, with the federal government slowly moving away from the idea of civilizing uh, slash integrating tribes and more into moving them out. The Compact of 1802, also known as the Georgia Compact, promised to extinguish American Indian land titles in the state of Georgia. Uh, in it, the U.S. paid Georgia $1.25 million U.S. million for its central and western lands. In return, they promised that the federal government would extinguish American Indian land titles in Georgia. Another big land purchase in 1803 would sow the seeds for the Trail of Tears. In 1803, the U.S. purchases 828,000 square miles of land from France, doubling the young nation's size. And this purchase would, for all intents and purposes, destroy what was left of that Indian reserve that King George III had established 40 years earlier for Britain in 1763. The Louisiana Purchase would give President Thomas Jefferson an opportunity to implement an idea he'd played around with for years, relocation of eastern tribes beyond the Mississippi River. 
There, Jefferson suggested American Indians could transition to American culture at their own pace, retain their autonomy, and live free from the trespasses of, of white American settlers. He'd first proposed this to the tribes themselves, namely the Cherokee. Although most Cherokees rejected the offer, small groups did move west to the Arkansas River area in 1810 and again between 1817 and 1819. In 1903, Jefferson sent a letter to, uh, sorry, 1903, I jumped way ahead there. Uh, <laughs> he's, he lived a long time. Uh, he's a Highlander. Uh, he was still alive at the beginning of the 20th century. No, 1803, Jefferson sent a letter to William Henry Harrison, uh, the then governor of Indiana Territory, where he spelled out the objectives of his policy in greater detail. He said, our settlements will gradually circumscribe and approach the Indians, and they will in time either incorporate with us as citizens or the United States uh, or remove beyond the Mississippi. The former is certainly the termination of their history, most happy for themselves, but in the whole course of this, it is essential to cultivate their love. As to their fear, we presume that our strength and their weakness is now so visible that they must see we have only to shut our hands to crush them, and that all our liberalities to them proceed from motives of pure humanity only. Should any tribe be foolhardy enough to take up the hatchet at any time, the seizing the whole country of that tribe and driving them across the Mississippi as the only condition of peace would be an example to others and a furtherance of our final consolidation. Damn, tough, tough words. Uh, we only have to shut our hand to crush them. He's not wrong, just intense hearing it like that. I think the speech would have been uh, a fair one, actually, if the Americans had, again, just made the option of integration more humane. But they didn't. They didn't want the tribes to blend in their, you know, culture with the culture of the new nation. They wanted them to renounce their old culture, to abandon it, uh, and also then become second-class citizens. So very, very heartless and arrogant. Tough, tough deal to sell. And there are still people like this today uh, in some ways. You know, people get all bent out of shape by the side of like, uh, you know, somebody wearing like a Muslim turban. Like that's somehow un-American. Why can't they just, you know, be an American? Uh, eh, American can look a lot, a lot of different ways. As long as, uh, you know, somebody saluting the same flag, paying the same taxes, following the same laws, uh, maybe we can shut the fuck up and let them enjoy, you know, the same the same freedom. I don't know. Freedom, that, sh that should be, uh, you know, the primary value when it comes to being American, not conformity. Uh, not too long after Jefferson sent this letter on January 30th, 1804, an interesting man named William Powell, Billy Powell, is born near Tuskegee, Alabama. As an adult, Powell would be given the name um, Osceola. His name was the combination of Ossie, a ceremonial black drink made from the Yapon holly, and Yahola, meaning shout or shouter. Okay. Uh, Powell would go on to be one of the most influential uh, seminal leaders in the history of their people. He had an interesting lineage. Powell was the great grandson of a Scotsman, James McQueen, also the son of a Creek mother, putting him squarely in the middle of the settler versus American Indian struggle. He was raised by his mom as Creek. When he was 10 in 1814, the Creeks were defeated by the U.S. in the Creek Wars, and William and his mother migrated to Florida with a small group of other Creeks. In Florida, William's band of Creeks joined up with some Seminole people. We'll catch up with Powell later. Uh, just know that he will be a major thorn in the side of the U.S. military when the Seminole resist relocation. Now that Georgia had all that land from Indian American titles uh, thrown out by the Georgia Compact, it was time to distribute them. From 1805 to 1833, the state of Georgia held lotteries to distribute the land seized from the Cherokees and Creeks. During these years, there would be eight lotteries in total. In 1812, or by 1812, approximately one-fourth of the Cherokee Nation from the southeastern U.S. had voluntarily migrated to what was called Arkansas Territory which was land between the White and Arkansas Rivers in northwest Kansas. Uh, June 18, 1812, the U.S. declares war on Britain, beginning the War of 1812. There were three main things in the U.S. Uh, that the, the U.S. was responding to by declaring this war. Uh, the British economic blockade of U.S. ally France, the kidnapping of American seamen in the British Royal Navy against their will, and the British support of tribes along the Great Lakes frontier. On that last point, the British had basically thought that by supporting indigenous resistance, they could crumble the young U.S. and maybe even get their prized colony back. Various tribes became involved in the conflict to secure British support for their own war against the U.S. Of course they were interested in fighting the U.S. The U.S. had been constantly taking their shit. Despite that, a few tribes remained neutral. Some even supported the United States, but the majority would ally with Britain. Uh, some other tribes allied with Spain would also use the war to strike at Americans. On July 17th, 1812, after being subjected to repeated raids by American plantation owners, the Spanish governor permits Florida tribes and former slaves to attack Georgia. On July 25th, 1812, 200 Seminole warriors and 40 African former slaves attacked plantations along the St. John's River. More escaped slaves soon joined the Seminole forces, causing American military leader Colonel Smith to write, the Seminoles have several hundred fugitive slaves from the Carolinas and Georgia at present in their towns, 
And unless they are checked soon, they will be so strengthened by more desertions from Georgia and Florida, it will be troublesome to reduce them. I like the way they talk back then. It will, it will be troublesome to reduce their numbers. Uh, unless we deal with this matter quickly, we will find it bothersome and troublesome to deal with the troublesome, bothersome situations that is being developed. Uh, June 4th, 1812, the Territory of Missouri is organized by Congress. It will soon become the new place where American Indian tribes will be relocated. Uh, during the War of 1812, which will last from June 18th, 1812 to February 18th, 1815, another war in America is being fought. The First Creek War starts in 1813, lasts until the following year. The First Creek War began as a civil war, largely centered among the Upper Creeks, whose towns were located on the Coosa, uh, Tallapoosa, and upper reaches of the Alabama rivers. Those are like the most Southern words. Uh, where where was this uh, happening? Well, it was happening along the rivers. It was along the Coosa, the Tallapoosa, and Alabama rivers. Uh, this struggle pitted a faction in the Creeks who became known as the Red Sticks against the Creeks who supported the National Council, a relatively new body that had developed from the traditional regional meetings of headmen from the Creek towns. Americans, fearful that more tribes would now ally with the British, quickly joined the war against the Red Sticks, turning the Civil War into a military campaign campaign designed to destroy Creek power. And during this war, future President Andrew Jackson would rise to prominence. Then a general, a militia general, Andrew Jackson's West Tennessee militia of 1,000 men was supported by 1,300 cavalry commanded by his friend and fellow militia general, John Coffey. Uh, uh, did I say cav- cavalry right? I think I did. If I didn't, cavalry. Uh, Jackson's force was also supplemented by a sizable contingent of Cherokee warriors. By November 3rd, Jackson secured the first American victory in the First Creek War when Coffee's cavalry routed Creeks at the town of, here we go, Tallusahatchee. Nailed it, uh, killing 200 warriors, as well as a number of women and children. American folk hero and frontiersman Davy Crockett, Davy, Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier, a servant in the Tennessee, Tennessee militia, commented, we shot him down like dogs. Brutal. In his memoirs, he also described participating in burning down a house where 46 Creek warriors and their families had taken refuge. Another man fighting that day, Richard C. Call, who would later become the territorial governor of Florida, would later recall the following. The next morning after our march, we entered the Indian village. And here I first saw the carnage of the battlefield. I saw it in its worst aspect when the hour of danger had passed. When I could excite no feeling or passion in my breasts, to control my sympathy and sorrow for human suffering. It was to me a horrible and revolting scene. The battle had ended in the village, the warriors fighting in their board houses, which gave little protection against the rifle bullets or musket ball. They fought in the midst of their wives and children who frequently shared their bloody fate. They fought bravely to the last, none asking or receiving quarter, nor did resistance cease until the last warrior had fallen. Humanity might well have wept over the gory scene before us. We found as many as eight or ten dead bodies in a single cabin. Sometimes the dead mother clasped the dead child to her breast, and to add another appalling horror to the bloody catalog, some of the cabins had taken fire, and half-consumed human bodies were seen amidst the smoking ruins. In other instances, dogs had torn and feasted on the mangled bodies of their masters. Heartsick, I turn from the revolting scene. Very different seems the picture in the cool moment of an action than in the excitement of battle. In the one passion, the desire to triumph and vengeance make demons. In the other, as the brain becomes more composed, the pulse to beat less quickly, the heart resumes its sway. And it would be a relief to shed tears over the carnage around us. I remember an instant of a brave young soldier who, after fighting like a tiger until the engagement was over, fainted at the sight of the blood he had helped spill. Damn! His words really seem to put you there, don't they? At least for someone who's never been involved in anything like that, they seem to. Man, war is hell. It doesn't sound like, at least from these sources, like anyone wanted to kill women and children that day. It sounds like people were trying to win a battle stay alive, and all the men and women children ended up being bottled up in the same buildings as people fighting, and God, just tragic. Also, to lighten things up a bit, which is tricky to do in today's uh, topic, uh, this guy's name was Richard Call, Dick Call, if you will, and that, of course, got my brain going, because I'm a child. Uh, I just have to acknowledge that his name is Dick Call before moving forward, and uh, also, I have to get this out of my system, it just, that name sounds like, uh, it reminded me of like a fucked up roll call. 
right? Where instead of saying like here or a uh, uh, present, when your name's called, uh, you just have to whip your dick out to, for the dick call, right? Just a bunch of dudes lined up at attention, just flopping their dicks out when their name is called. Benjamin Cushing, zip, flop. Malcolm Jackson, zip, flop. Bohai Chang, zip, flop. Jonathan Martinez, zip, boing, Whoa, Johnny, a little too excited for dick call this morning. Simmer down. Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, zip. Come on, son. Come on, flop him out. I'm not messing around. It's dick call. Flop. It's not that cold in this room. You get it. Come on. I'm done now. What's wrong with me? Uh, back to the First Creek War. Uh, the First Creek War resulted in the total defeat of the Creek people at the hands of American armies and their Indian American allies. The death rate during the various Creek War battles was high, with estimates ranging from 1,500 to 1,300. In the treaty that ended the war, Andrew Jackson had the Creeks, and uh, I have to get this out of my head too. I should have, I flipped, I don't know why I flipped American Indian back then to Indian American. You know what I meant. Uh, in the treaty that ended the war, Andrew Jackson had the Creeks surrender over 23 million acres of their traditional land, a lot of land, about one half of present day Alabama and a fifth of Georgia. From 1814 to 1824, Jackson would have a hand in negotiating so many more treaties, nine out of 11 treaties, which divested the South, uh, the Southern tribes of their Eastern lands in exchange for lands in the West. Why did these tribes agree to have these treaties take more and more of their land? Well, because they didn't have much of a choice. They didn't, have, they didn't have any good choices being presented to them. If they didn't negotiate a treaty, they knew they'd eventually just be forced to leave. So they negotiated to try and appease the U.S. government in hopes of retaining some of their land for a little while longer and to protect themselves from white harassment. As a result of all these treaties, the U.S. states uh, gained control over three-quarters of Alabama and Florida, as well as parts of Georgia, Tennessee, Mississippi, Kentucky, and North Carolina. This was a period of voluntary uh, native migration. However, and only a small number of Creeks, Cherokee, and Choctaws actually uh, actually did move to the new lands, though. Most remained on lands that now belong to the U.S. government, you know, setting the stage for, you know, uh, more, more conflict later. Meanwhile, around 1815, the Seminoles were not negotiating. They were fighting right now. The Seminoles and black Seminoles, the runaway and freed slaves who lived on Seminole lands, were aligned with the British against the Americans before and during the War of 1812, putting a big target on them when the U.S. won the War of 1812 on February 18th, 1815. Uh, by 1816, U.S. soldiers destroyed destroyed a garrison on Seminole lands that was a refuge for escaped slaves, and they killed around 270 people. The Seminoles subsequently began raiding American settlements along the Georgia-Florida border. Then the U.S. Army started making frequent incursions into Spanish Florida, attacking the Seminole and recapturing slaves. The First Seminole War would begin in the fall of 1817, would last until 1819. On November 21st, 1817, the First Seminole War officially began when General Edmund P. P. Gaines attacked the Seminole town of Fowltown with 250 men. The first attempt was beaten off by the Seminole. The next day, November 22nd, 1817, the Seminole were driven from their village. In retaliation, a group of Seminoles laid siege to a boat carrying reinforcements to Fort Scott on the Apalachicola River and killed 43 men, women, and children. Shit's getting ugly on both sides. Uh, this is a good time to point out that it's not like the U.S. was fighting dirty and the tribes were always fighting clean and took the high road. Uh, that also not true at all. A variety of tribes, when they attacked U.S. settlers, did not stop at fighting with armed settlers. They killed unarmed settlers, including unarmed women and children, you know, plenty of times. Again, war is hell. A week later, Seminoles attacked a boat carrying supplies for Camp Crawford. That event would become known as the Scott Massacre because the boat was commanded by Lieutenant Richard W. Scott. There were 40 to 50 people on the boat, including 26 soldiers, seven wives of soldiers, and some children. And most of the boat's passengers were killed. The children were supposedly killed by having their heads bashed against the sides of the boat, and Scott was killed by having pine stakes driven into his body and set on fucking fire. An excruciating form of execution that had its roots in ancient Creek traditions. Uh, one woman and six men survived by jumping into the river, swimming to the opposite shore of the people who were attacking them, found a band of friendly Creeks who would help them get to Camp Crawford, which was later renamed Fort Scott. U.S. Secretary of War John C. Calhoun, not understandably happy about all this, and he orders General Andrew Jackson to lead an invasion into Florida and to wipe the Seminoles out. In the spring of 1817, Jackson follows Calhoun's orders. He leads troops against Seminole villages on Lake Miccosukee and along the Suwannee River, destroying them as he goes. He also seizes the Spanish military post at what is now St. Mark's and then proceeds to take the Spanish-held town of Pensacola, paving the way for Spain to give Florida to the U.S. By 1821, Florida was brought under full U.S. control as Spain formally cedes Florida to the U.S. as part of the adams onis Treaty. And Andrew Jackson would be appointed by Congress as the first governor of the new Florida territory. More territory means more plans to move natives out of that territory. 
Between 1817 and 1827, the Cherokee tried to appease their new American rulers. They learned to speak English. Uh, many of them converted to Christianity. A few years down the line, they decide that rather than being governed by a traditional tribal council, the tribe would create a two-house legislature modeled after the U.S., right? They were trying real hard to assimilate. Would that assimilation help? No, not really. Uh, because assimilation wasn't really what, uh, you know, most wanted. They just, they wanted to take their land. Another shitty part of the history here. Even when tribe members did try to do what Americans wanted, they were usually still run out of town for not being white. Uh, they still usually had their shit taken from them by white settlers who took advantage of them for having little uh, or no rights, right? People who knew the U.S. government would not do shit to protect them. On May 3rd, 1819, Congress passes an act regarding the civilization of the Indian tribes, more commonly known as the Civilization Fund Act of 1819. It was intended to protect American tribes against population declines, but it would actually have the opposite effect. There was a provision in it that gave the U.S. president the authority and funds to take any actions that the office saw fit to make the tribes more, quote, civilized. Congress then authorizes an annual sum of $10,000 as a civilization fund to teach agriculture, reading, writing, and arithmetic to American Indian people, hoping they will adopt the American ways. In 1821, the Cherokee scholar Sequoia creates that, uh, there we go, uh, syllabary. I think, I think I said it wrong earlier. I think I said like syllabary or something. Uh, syllabary of the Cherokee language, a set of written symbols, each of which represents a syllable used to write a given language. Um, yeah, and again, we mentioned that earlier. It's worth explaining a bit more here because it shows just how much the Cherokees were adapting, how hard they were trying. Before this uh, syllab uh, syllabary, the Cherokees had viewed the white man's written, uh, written, my mouth is all over the place more than usual today. I don't know what's been doing that all day. Uh, before this, uh, the Cherokees had viewed the white man's written records as witchcraft. There we go. Uh, this guy's wife, um, so many names in this suck. The Sequoia's wife actually burned his initial work as she believed it was some form of witchcraft the first time he worked on this. After the celebrity, uh, they were able to codify their laws, adopt a written constitution, better govern and educate themselves and express their viewpoints in print. Some historians speculate that the Cherokee nation likely had better literacy rates than their white neighbors. This would also lead to other tribes developing their own written languages. Before long, all of the five civilized tribes had significant populations of people who could read and write. But in the end, that would not save the Cherokee and other tribes from the Trail of Tears. On February 28, 1823, the Supreme Court case Johnson versus McIntosh establishes that private citizens can't purchase lands directly from natives. So uh, this is going to make things, you know, uh, obviously harder for the tribes, the court determines that the U.S. government had acquired free title to the land based on the long-standing practices of European colonization, and therefore, natives could sell their land only to the U.S. government. Again, they should have been given the option to homestead, like other citizens. They should have been able to just become citizens. Did not have to go down like this. Uh, September 18, 1823, the Treaty of Moultrie Creek ends the First Creek War. The treaty established a reservation in the center of Florida, and uh, on land that unfortunately was not fit for the Seminoles' traditional practices practices of herding and planting. The treaty also said that the Americans could build roads through the reservation. The U.S. government doubled down on that by building a series of forts and trading posts in the territory, mainly along the Gulf and Atlantic coasts. In July 1827, the Cherokees adopt their written constitution, an act that antagonized pro-removal Americans in Georgia. It seemed like the Cherokees were really there to stay. Like the U.S. Constitution, the Cherokee Constitution set up three branches of government. It also outlined due process in the court system, including a speedy public trial by an impartial jury, not being compelled to give evidence against oneself, no double jeopardy, and protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. So what's going on here? Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I just don't see the point of trying to establish a country within another country. I mean, I get why the Cherokee did this. I get why they tried this. Right? The U.S. government was not doing fuck all to protect them, so they tried to protect themselves. Again, if they, if they just could have been fucking citizens, this all could be avoided. It's just so weird to try and establish like a kind of country inside of another country. That's just a recipe for confusion at best, disaster at worst, I think. In 1828, Andrew Jackson is elected president and his presidency would not bode well for American Indians. The same year, 1828, the Cherokee Nation elects John Ross as his chief, as their chief, excuse me. He would serve longer than anyone else in that position from 1828 to 1866. Once he takes office, Jackson will not waste any time attempting to send the tribes west. On May 6, 1828, the Treaty of Washington is signed. This treaty addresses members of the Cherokee Nation west of the Mississippi, guaranteeing them 7 million acres of land and a perpetual outlet west as far as the sovereignty of the U.S. extends. The government promises to give a good rifle, a blanket, a kettle, and five pounds of tobacco to each member of his family, also one blanket, 
a just compensation for the property he may abandon to any Cherokee who promises to move west of the Mississippi. If you take this offer, <laughs> it does seem kind of like a fucked up offer. Listen, I know you're going to leave all your stuff behind. We're going to make it up to you. We're going to give you not just a pound of tobacco, five pounds. Come on. And hey, and a blanket. Not, not like one blanket. Come on. A blanket for every family member. And, uh, and a kettle. I mean, you know, a kettle. And, uh, and a rifle. So, you know, that seems fair. You leave your homeland, leave everything you've you know ever known behind, and we're going to give you some nice blankets. Uh, a few months later, on December 20th, 1828, the state of Georgia takes matters into their own hands and matters of uh, American Indian removal. Gold has been discovered now near present-day Dahlonega. I think that's how, yeah. Oh, uh, Dahlonega. There we go. Dahlonega. There we go. Dahlonega. My God. Dahlonega, Georgia. And this led to the first major gold rush in the U.S., and unfortunately for the Cherokee, the gold was discovered on Cherokee land. And that would considerably speed up the inevitable takeover of their land. Georgia was afraid that the U.S. wasn't going to do anything to remove the Cherokee nation until the state legislature passed a series of laws that stripped the Cherokee of their rights under the laws of the state. The Georgia legislature then annulled the Cherokee constitution and ordered seizure of their lands. So much for that whole government within a government thing. In January of 1829, uh, John Ross, principal chief of the Cherokee Nation Tribal Band, leads a delegation to Washington in an attempt to get them to outrank the state of Georgia's recent ruling and keep settlers off their land. Three months later, in April of 1829, John H. Eaton, Secretary of War, informs John Ross, the Cherokee delegate, that President Jackson would support Georgia's right to control Cherokee lands. In late 1829, northern Georgia was flooded by thousands of prospectors on the hunt for gold. By the spring of 1830, there would be 4,000 miners working along Yahula <laughs> Creek. There we go, Yahula Creek alone. A writer for the Cherokee newspaper, the Cherokee Phoenix, said, Our neighbors who regard no law or pay no respect to the laws of humanity are now reaping a plentiful harvest by the law of Georgia, which declares that no Indian shall be a party in any court created by the laws or constitution of that state. These neighbors come over the line and take the cattle belonging to the Cherokee. Cherokee go in pursuit of their property, but all they can do, uh, but all they can effect is to see their cattle snugly kept in the lots of these robbers. We are an abused people. If we can receive no redress, we can feel deeply the injustice done to our rights. And this is so fucked up just to like have no recourse. Like I just imagine how crazy that would be. If all of a sudden, like all of your neighbors, you know, like the laws apply to all of them, but you don't get the, the same rights at all. And like somebody comes and just takes some shit out of your yard. And like, hey, what the fuck? And you call the police. They're like, oh, no, no, you can, they can do that. I mean, I'm surprised more people haven't done it already. And then like, like they just take your grill and then you just watch your neighbor barbecue on your, your grill. Maybe you go get another grill and then the fucking other, another neighbor takes it. Call the police. They're like, yeah, no, we told you before. They can take whatever they want. Uh, sorry, nothing we can do. You're, you know, you're not a citizen. You don't have any rights. So, you know, they do. Uh, actually, they have the rights to take your stuff legally. It's, uh, it's what the court decided. It's just so fucked up. Uh, okay. J January 1st, 1830, with the force of some 30 Cherokee and the permission of the federal government, the Cherokee leader Major Ridge evicts white settlers now from Cherokee land along the Georgia-Alabama border. Uh, and this eviction will infuriate Georgia politicians. So somebody does try and be like, you know what? Fuck that. Our laws say you can't be here. Get out. Uh, February 15th, 1830, the debates over removing or keeping American Indian tribes rages in Congress. A vast majority of the legislature is pro-removal but there were small vocal pockets of opposition, including Quakers and abolitionists who championed native rights. Uh, there was also people who weren't lawmakers getting in on the discussion. In a petition to Congress in 1830, a group of women from Steubenville, Ohio, used their only political right, the right of petition to protest the Cherokee removal and to argue in favor of Native American natural rights. Part of this petition read, even in private life, we may not presume to direct the general conduct or control the acts of those who stand in the near and guardian relations of husbands and brothers. Yet all admit that there are times when duty and affection call on us to advise and persuade, as well as to cheer or console. And if cheer or console. And if we approach the public representatives of our husbands and brothers only in the humble character of suppliants in the cause of mercy and humanity, may we not hope that even the small voice of female sympathy will be heard. And despite of the undoubted national right which the Indians have to the land of their forefathers, and in the face of solemn treaties, pledging the faith of the nation for their secure possession of those lands, it is intended, we are told, to force them from their native soil, to compel them to seek new homes in a distant and dreary wilderness. To you then, as the constitutional protect protectors of the Indians within our territory, 
And as the peculiar guardians of our national character and our counter's warfare, we solemnly and honestly appeal to save this remnant of much injured people from annihilation, to shield our country from the curses denounced on the cruel and ungrateful, and to shelter the American character from lasting dishonor. And that petition uh, would be ignored. Also, the way people wrote back then, I, I often wonder, is, like, is that how they talk, just conversation a lot too? It's very, it's very flowery. <laughs> it seems, it seems like they could, they could have said all of that in like one paragraph instead of five. I mean, can you imagine having to listen to somebody just like talk to you that way conversationally? Uh, dear, <laughs> hello, brother. It is so good to see you. I'm so glad to be in your company. I was wondering, perhaps, as I often wonder, and many of my fellow friends will wonder, will I still enjoy the company of my brethren? It, if it has been many years since I've seen them before, and they're just, what the fuck? Just, what are you trying to say, Susan? Are you worried about? No, we're fine. We're good. We can hang out. Let's just go hang out. Okay, just fuck. I feel like back then I'm so impatient. I'll be conscious. Like, this, this, this. Come on, spit it out. What are you trying to say? We don't like it. Well, there you go. Okay, we think it's wrong. Boom. Okay, next short sentence. All right, we heard you. Also, how fucked up just the, just the way things were so misogynistic back then. Just the beginning of that. A uh, letter, you know, like, uh, you know, normally we, uh, <laughs> we just, uh, you know, listen to our husbands and brothers and, um, you know, it's our duty just to tr try and advise and persuade sometimes, but not too much. Holy shit. Things are not perfect now, but God, they've gotten a lot better. Uh, May 28th, 1830, Congress passes the Indian Removal Act. Lawmakers were deeply divided over this act. The U.S. Senate vote was 28 to 19 in favor. The vote in the House of Representatives was even closer, 102 to 97. Uh, President Andrew Jackson signed the measure into law on May 28th, 1830. The first part of the act went like this. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that it shall and may be lawful for the President of the United States to cause so much of any territory belonging to the United States west of the River Mississippi, not included in any state or organized territory, and to which the Indian title has been extinguished, as he may judge necessary to be divided into a suitable number of districts for the reception of such tribes or nations of Indians as may choose to exchange the lands where they now reside and remove there. Uh, that was one sentence that didn't even finish. It ended with a dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Some wordy motherfuckers. Uh, this act vastly extended the power of the federal government and especially the president uh, had over the tribes. Uh, section seven would read, uh, this is a little shorter here, and be it further enacted that it shall and may be lawful for the president to have the same superintendence and care over any tribe or nation in the country to which they may remove as contemplated by this act that he is now authorized to have over them at their present places of residence. Uh, residence, yeah. Uh, yeah, Jackson was at the helm of the creation of this act. And as president, now his biggest enforcer, I cannot be a politician. My God. But people talking that legal language all the time, I'd go crazy. I had to listen to one boring dude after another be like, and furthermore, may it impress this Senate uh, that for the act of creating this act shall thusly be satisfied for thou and thee and... Th uh, shut the fuck up, Reginald! Just fucking spit it out! I'm hungry! Uh... <laughs> it annoys me like, like reading it secondhand. I can't imagine, you know, back then. My God. I don't know. People, they moved at a slower pace back then. Uh, Jackson's attitude towards tribe members was paternalistic, patronizing at best, contemptuous at worst. Why did he feel what he felt towards them? A lot of people wonder, like, why? Why did Andrew Jackson, like, want to get the, you know, Indians, like, kicked out so badly? Well, as a boy in the 1770s, Jackson's later sentiments were partially shaped by listening to stories of native violence towards settlers. And with no apparent understanding of their motives, he developed prejudices that he, like many Americans of his day, would hold throughout his life. He routinely called uh, them savages, people of mixed heritage he called half-breeds. He was unshakable in his conviction that American Indians should just be removed from the South. He saw them as violent people. Uh, when news that the Red Sticks were attacking settlers reached him in Nashville, he asked, is a citizen of the United States to remain under the barbarous or barbarous lash of cruel and unrelenting savages? He just wanted them gone. And so did many other settlers. And for many of them, uh, not actually always in, cruel, in a cruel way. They seem to have really thought it would be better for everyone just to have them relocate west. Many Americans at the time seemed to truly believe that the U.S. would never extend beyond the Mississippi, right? They'd be happy where they were. The, the natives could go live, you know, west of the Mississippi, and it's going to be great for everybody. 
And if that would have been true, then relocation would have, I guess, maybe saved everyone. But white settlers, you know, they could no longer fear attacks. Tribes could live in a vast land where they could govern themselves in peace. But that was never going to happen. I mean, U.S. expansionism was just not going to stop. I don't know how people could actually think that. Uh, also, I find this fascinating. Many white people at the time uh, were not in favor of removal and relocation for the tribes. Uh, a lot of people at the time did feel it was morally wrong. Not everyone held Andrew Jackson's sentiments, not at all. Uh, politician Ed Edward Everett, a congressman from Massachusetts at the time, said this as a part of a series of speech speeches on the Indian Removal Act. He said, the evil, sir, is enormous. The inevitable suffering is the inevitable suffering incalculable. Do not stain the fair fame of the country. Nations of dependent Indians against their will under color of law are driven from their homes into the wilderness. You cannot explain it. You cannot reason it away. Our friends will view this measure with sorrow and our enemies alone with joy. And we ourselves, sir, when the interests and passions of the day are past, shall look back upon it, I fear, with self-reproach and a regret as bitter as unavailing. Interestingly, uh, even the legendary frontiersman and Tennessee Congressman Davy Crockett, Davy, Davy Crockett, uh, who'd fought, as we mentioned, in the First Creek War with Jackson, opposed the Indian Removal Act, declaring that his opposition would not make me ashamed in the Day of Judgment. Uh, despite the opposition, the law passed. Jackson was real quick to get the removal ball rolling. The Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek was a treaty signed on September 27, 1830, between the Choctaw Tribe and the U.S. government. This was the first removal treaty uh, that uh, occurred under the Indian Removal Act. The treaty removed the Choctaw from their land and provided them with reservations in Oklahoma. Thousands of Choctaw would now walk 500 miles through blizzards. Uh, imagine that. Imagine walking 500 miles through good weather. If you're young, imagine your grandpa or grandma having to do that. Uh, they could have been allowed to become full citizens again, but uh, nope. Uh, the, the blizzards combined with food and wagon shortages led to the deaths of hundreds. Between a third and half of those who began the journey did not see it to the end. Man, imagine walking 500 miles and having your grandparents die halfway into the trip having to quickly toss their bodies into a shallow grave and then just keep on walking. That's what happened. Uh, that march became known as the Choctaw Trail of Tears. Alex de Tocqueville, a uh, famous French writer and thinker, uh, I think I'm saying his name wrong, so I apologize. I don't have the pronunciation guide with him. It's, uh, it's, it's Alexis de, and then it's T-O-C-Q-U-E-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. So, Tuck, who knows? <laughs> I could, I could guess, but I'm not going to be fucking even close. Uh, he was visiting Memphis when the Choctaw arrived on their way west, and he would write, the wounded, the sick, the newborn babies, and the old men on the point of death. I saw them embarked across the great river, and the sight will never fade from my memory. Neither sob nor complaint rose from that silent assembly. Their afflictions were of long standing, and they felt them to be irremediable. <laughs> Needless tragedy. Uh, on December 6th, 1830, Andrew Jackson makes his second message or annual message to Congress. He tries to make the march you just heard sound like something awesome. Like, it's, it's a great thing. Every, every, no, everything's good. Everything's really good. Uh, the people walking and dying on their way west, it, it's, it's what's best. Uh, you know, it's fine. Every, everything's fine. It gives me pleasure to announce to Congress that the benevolent policy of the government, steadily pursued for nearly 30 years, in relation to the removal of the Indians beyond the white settlements is approaching to a happy consummation. Two important tribes have accepted the provision made for their removal, and it is believed that their example will induce the remaining tribes also to seek the same obvious advantage. What good man would prefer a country covered with forests and ranged by a few thousand savages to our extensive republic studded with cities, towns, and prosperous farms? and filled with all the blessings of liberty, civilization, and religion. <laughs> Doubtless it will be painful to leave the graves of their fathers, but what do they more than our ancestors did or than our children are now doing? How many thousands of our own people would gladly embrace the opportunity of removing to the West on such conditions? Come on, everybody! Don't be sad about the Trail of Tears. They, sh they should call it the Trail of Happy Fun the trail of exciting possibilities, the trail of a kick-ass fresh start, the trail of a, aren't you so lucky to be walking along this sick-ass fucking trail, motherfucker? Oh, enjoy it! <laughs> God, he's, that was some propaganda there. Oh, my God. And, then, and also just taking some random shots. What, I, mean, what good, I mean, what good man would want living in a bunch of fucking woods, a teepee anyway, instead of a fucking farm? I mean, good riddance, right? They're lucky and they don't even appreciate it as grandparents are, you know, marching to death on some trail. 
Uh, Jackson tried to appeal to settlers' sensibilities by pointing out that the tribes were doing, you know, just what the, the settlers' forefathers and they themselves had done. They were just heading west for new lands. You now it's a good thing. He just failed to mention that they, you know, they wouldn't be given ownership of land out west in the way the homesteaders would. And he also failed to mention that, you know, when uh, the white settlers were moving out west, uh, they weren't being done, you know, so at, at gunpoint. So slightly different circumstances and motivation there. Uh, on March 18th, 1831, the Cherokee Nation decides to fight back through legal channels. They take their fight to the Supreme Court in a case called Cherokee Nation versus State of Georgia. Cherokee Nation was responding to the steady erosions of the rights that had taken place, you know, throughout the 1820s by the Georgia State Legislature. They asked the Supreme Court to determine whether a state can impose its laws on indigenous peoples and their territory, and they wouldn't get the answer they wanted. On March 18th, 1831, Chief Justice John Marshall declared that the Indian Territory is admitted to compose a part of the United States and affirmed that the tribes were domestic dependent nations and their relation to the United States resembles that of a ward to his guardian. So, right, this, that country was inside a country does not work. The court rules that it does not have the jurisdiction over the case. Marshall also then denies Indians the right to court protection because they are not subject to the laws of the Constitution. He says that each tribe is a distinct political entity capable of managing its own affairs. So he, say, he says, you don't get to manage your own affairs. You're not your own country but I can't help you because you're your own country. <laughs> this ruling shows how fucked up America's relationship with the tribes was at this point, right? They're ruled as being independent political entities when they asked the U.S. government to protect them, to help them. And then they're ruled as not being independent political entities when they, uh, you know, other people asked the U.S. government to take their shit. It's all very confusing. From 1831 to 1832, several tribes in Ohio signed treaties that lead to their removal, including the Seneca, Shawnee, and Ottawa. Uh, 1832 would be a busy year. Andrew Jackson's reelected president, the Treaty of Payne's Landing begins a process of removing the Seminoles from Florida. The Treaty of Pontotoc in Mississippi starts the same process for the Chickasaw. Up north, the Huron of Ohio cede their lands to the Treaty of McCutcheonsville. The following tribes conclude various treaties with the U.S. and are forced to give up their lands as well. The Sac and Fox cede lands east of the Mississippi River for some land in Kansas. The Prairie Band of uh, Potawatomi. Ooh. Potawatomi, Potawatomi uh, seed lands in Indiana for land in Kansas. The Shawnees, Delaware, seed lands in Missouri for lands in Kansas. The uh, Kuskaskia, Kus, oh my gosh, Kuskaskia, Kuskaskia, and Peoria seed lands in Illinois and Missouri. Small tribes of Stockbridge, Muncie, Brotherton, New York, Oneida seed lands. The uh, Piancasha, the Wee in Illinois and Missouri seed lands. 1832 would see another big Supreme Court case. Uh, in Worcester versus Georgia, Supreme Court rules that the federal government, not the states, has jurisdiction over Indian territories. The case came about because of a missionary leaving, living among the Cherokees, Samuel A. Worcester, who was jailed for refusing to comply with a Georgia law that required all white settlers residing on Indian land swear an oath of allegiance to the state. Basically, Georgia didn't like white people just deciding to live amongst the Cherokee without their expressed written permission. Uh, but these missionaries, led by Worcester, decided they didn't care what the federal government thought. They felt that they only needed the Cherokees' permission to live on the land. If the missionaries had been allowed, or sorry, they didn't care what the uh, state government thought. Uh, if the missionaries had been allowed to continue living on Cherokee land, that would have meant that the Cherokee decided what happened on their land, not the government. Uh, the missionaries weren't. Worcester and his crew were arrested and given hard labor. And the case would make its way to the Supreme Court. This time, Chief Justice John Marshall makes a different call. He rules against Georgia and says that the American Indian must be treated as nations by the national government and that state laws have no force on their territories. Supreme Court rules that the Cherokee Nation was entitled to federal protection from the state laws of Georgia, including the one about who could live there. The case established that now no one could enter Cherokee lands without the permission of the Cherokee or a treaty. But not everyone would cooperate with this ruling. Laws only have power if they are enforced. If not, they're nothing more than words on paper. Uh, this is another shitty part of this uh, kind of legacy here. Every once in a while, pro-native legislation of some sort would be passed, but it was then not enforced. Uh, defying the court, Georgia kept Worcester in jail. It was just like, all right, you can fucking pass that law. We don't give a shit. We're still going to do it the way we want to do it. Uh, and then President Jackson backed them up. Uh, when asked to correct the situation, he said, the chief justice has made his ruling. Now let him enforce it. So, you know, that's basically saying like, don't give a shit. And the ruling would never be enforced. Now back to the Seminole in Florida. On May 9th, 1832, the Seminole and the U.S. signed the Treaty of Payne's Landing. The treaty says the Seminoles would move west of the Mississippi along with the creeks. That wouldn't exactly go as planned. It would take almost 20 years and $15 million to force a tribe from their lands. In 1833, the Quapaw people of Arkansas concluded a treaty that removed the tribe to a plot of land in the tiny northeast corner that bordered Kansas and Missouri. That year, the Illinois Kickapoo also removed to Kansas. The Ottawas of Ohio gave up their land and relocated. 
1833, the Choctaw, what remained to them, finished their forced removal to Indian territory. Each of these tribes would experience their own trail of tears. 1834, Congress restructured, restructured the Bureau of Indian Affairs as the Department of Indian Affairs, expanding the agency's responsibilities to include regulating trade with the tribes and administering the Indian lands in the West. Same year, the Caddo tribe of Louisiana were instructed to follow previous tribes to Indian territory. They ultimately migrated to the Indian Republic of Texas. Federal agents also oversaw the removal of the Hoboy of the Apalachicola, there we go, Apalachicola of Florida in 1834 and the beginnings of Creek removal. So many different tribes. Don't worry about keeping track of all of them. Uh, it's a totality that's important. Uh, with so many different tribes arriving in Indian territory, the government now started to redefine what Indian territory was and how American Indians were going to fit in to the U.S. government system. The Indian Intercourse Acts of 1834 designated territories west of Missouri, Arkansas, and Louisiana as Indian territory, extending from the Red River of Texas north to the Canadian border. The first is a huge swath of land. In December 1834, Davy Crockett writes a letter complaining about President Jackson's forced removal of the Cherokees from their homes to Oklahoma. Davy Crockett, that's, uh, we got to suck him someday. Interesting, fascinating life. Interesting to note that Davy Crockett was anti-removal because he had the exact kind of legendary frontiersman status that people usually seem to associate with being violently anti-Indian. Uh, Davy Crockett was born in eastern Tennessee on August 17th, 1786, one of nine children of pioneer parents John and Rebecca Crockett, much like President Jackson himself. Uh, like Jackson, Crockett received no significant academic education. For much of his teenage life, his teacher was the frontier. He became a skilled woodsman, scout, and hunter. Like Jackson, he fought against American Indians. In 1813, Crockett joined the Tennessee militia as a scout and fought against the Creek Indians in Alabama. He, particip he participated in that massacre at uh, Tallusahatchee, led by Jackson, in retaliation for a native attack on Fort Mims. We talked about that, that battle where he said the Creek were shot down like dogs. Unlike Jackson, he was not pro-removal. He felt it was wrong. I think this is really important to note because sometimes, and I'm often guilty of this myself, you know, I'll think like, yeah, a lot of fucked up stuff happened, but it was a different time. And people had different beliefs, so you can't really blame them, right? You can't expect them to understand how wrong what they were doing was. You can't judge early 20th century morality by uh, 2021 standards. But maybe you can sometimes. Crockett thought it was wrong in 1834, and he was not alone. So maybe people did know that what they were doing was super fucked up here. Or at least a bunch of people probably did, and they just did it anyway because they just wanted the land. Uh, back to Crockett's letter. Crockett opposed American Indian removal, and he was worried that if Jackson's vice president, Martin Van Buren, was elected president in 1836, the American Indian removal he despised would continue. Crockett even went so far as to say that if Van Buren was elected, Crockett would leave the U.S. for the wilds of Texas. A longer quote from his letter goes like this. I will consider that government, I, I will consider that government a paradise to what this will be. In fact, at this time, our Republican government has dwindled almost into insignificancy. Our boasted land of liberty have almost bowed to the yoke of bondage. And Crockett actually would go to Texas before Martin Van Buren was elected president. He would die in the Battle of the Alamo on March 6, 1836, a couple months before the election. Gotta suck that dude. Yeah, again, one of these days. April 3rd, 1835. We're back with the Seminole now, one of the few tribes who have been able to resist any forced removal up to this point. On April 3rd, Indian agent Wiley Thompson, who's a former Georgia politician, uh, tell Seminole leaders that the Treaty of Payne's Landing went through and it is time to begin relocating. In a sad twist, Wiley Thompson was at one time considered a friend by the Seminole leader, uh, Osceola, or Billy Powell, whom we met earlier. Thompson even gave Osceola a rifle as a gift, and then Thompson would start pursuing Georgia's policies, eliminating the diplomatic status of any Seminole who opposed the removal treaty and stopping the trade of ammunition to the tribe. Osceola felt insulted by Thompson's actions, said they were barbaric, and the one-time allies, allies became enemies. On one occasion, while the events of the Seminole Defiance were still unfolding, Osceola angrily barged into Thompson's office to express his dissatisfaction with the Indian agent's actions against his people. In a response, Thompson ordered Osceola's arrest, had him spend six nights at Fort King until he agreed to sign the Treaty of Payne's Landing. Osceola was offended deeply on two fronts, at the fact of his imprisonment and at Thompson's heavy-handed persuasion. He penned his own signature and swore to get even with the American. And the Seminole community would back Osceola up, saying that the Treaty of Payne's Landing was signed under coercion and duress, and they would not accept the terms. Tensions were high. War was coming. On December 23rd, 1835, two U.S. Army companies of 110 men each set off from Fort Brook near present-day Tampa on their way to Fort King, which is present-day Ocala, or Ocala. The companies included soldiers from the 2nd Artillery, 3rd Artillery, and 4th Infantry Regiments and were led by Major Francis Langhorn Dade. Their mission was simple. They were resupplying, adding forces to Fort King. 
and they were being shadowed by Seminole warriors who followed them at a distance, silently riding a couple of swamp horses, some for Twuxley, some gator steeds. I wish that was true so badly. Now I picture the gator steeds with spiked little war saddles on their backs. They have steel war helmets on their gator heads. And they're trained that when you give them the right command, they let you dismount and then they rush your enemy and try and kill them. Just fucking chomp them. How sweet would that be if you had a swamp horse that could attack people on its own? Anyway, confrontation is looming. The Seminole scouts watched the soldiers in their sky blue uniforms for five days before the war would begin. On December 28th, 1835, the Second Seminole War begins. While the First Seminole War saw the U.S. pitted against the Seminoles when the U.S. made incursions into the Spanish-held Florida, this time the Seminoles were on the offensive. As Major Francis Dade marched from Fort Brooke towards Fort King, 180 Seminole warriors led by war chiefs uh, McCanopy, Alligator, and Jumper attacked. I'm not making up those names. Only one or two men of that army detachment, sources differ, survived the ambush. Major Dade, who was on horseback, was killed in the Seminoles' very first shot fired by Chief uh, McCanopy. Following Dade's death, command passed to George, Captain George W. Gardner, an eyewitness account by the Seminole leader Alligator went like this. We had been preparing for this for more than a year. Just as the day was breaking, we moved out of the swamp into the Pine Barren. I counted, by direction of Jumper, 180 warriors. Upon approaching the road, each man chose his position on the west side. About nine o'clock in the morning, the command approached. So soon as all the soldiers were opposite. Jumper gave the whoop. The canopy fired the first rifle. The signal agreed upon. When every Indian arose and fired, which laid upon the ground dead more than half the white men. The cannon was discharged several times, but the men who loaded it were shot down as soon as the smoke cleared away. As we were returning to the swamp, supposing all were dead, an Indian came up and said the white men were building a fort of logs. Jumper and myself with ten warriors returned. As we approached, we saw six men behind two logs placed one above another, with the cannon a short distance off. We soon came near as the balls went over us. They had guns but no powder. We looked in the boxes afterwards and found they were empty. So blood has been spilt and the Second Seminole War is on. The campaigns of the Second Seminole War really showcased the elite guerrilla warfare abilities of the Seminole. Jumper, Alligator, McCanopy, Osceola, leading less than 3,000 warriors, were pitted against four U.S. generals and more than 30,000 troops. It was the fiercest and bloodiest war between Americans and American Indians. The United States would spend more than $20 million fighting the Seminoles. The war left more than 1,500 soldiers and an uncounted number of American civilians dead by the war's end in 1842. One of the American dead ended up being that Indian agent, Wiley Thompson. On December 28, 1835, Osceola shot him with the very rifle that Thompson had previously gifted him. How crazy is that? I wonder if Thompson's last words were, are you kidding me? With that gun? Are you fucking kidding me? And he dies. Uh, Raids, skirmishes, and a handful of larger battles raged throughout the Florida Peninsula over the next few years. Now let's see how the Chickasees and their plan of legal resistance. I'm sorry. Now let's see how the Cherokees uh, and their plan of legal resistance is going in 1835. Not well. On December 29, 1835, the Treaty of New Echota commanded that all Cherokees were to be removed to west of the Mississippi River. The Treaty of New Echota was brokered by a small contingent of Cherokee leaders, including Major Ridge, his son John Ridge, and Elias Boutonot. Who wasn't there was Chief John Ross and a majority of the tribe that didn't like the terms of the treaty and didn't want to sign. This was a strategy the U.S. Uh, federal government would deploy time and time again when dealing with the tribes. They'd find a group that claimed to represent a tribe's interests, a group that was willing to do what they wanted them to do, and have them sign what needed to be signed, while the real tribal rulers either had no idea what the fuck was going on or were adamantly opposed to what was going on. Super shady. Uh, the terms of this treaty had the Cherokee give up all their lands in Georgia for territory in present-day Oklahoma. This treaty led directly to the Cherokee Trail of Tears, the march most associated with the Trail of Tears. A small contingent of tribe members who signed it believed that removal was inevitable and tried to protect Cherokee rights in the process as best they could, thinking that they had to bargain while they still had some chips to bargain with. And not, you know, necessarily wrong there. The new bargainers were a group of rising young chiefs in the Cherokee Nation who wanted to change the way the Cherokee and the U.S. government interacted. Head chief John Ross strongly disagreed with them. And uh, his disagreement will be shown violently later. Uh, protesting the Treaty of New Echota, Ross and other leaders of the Cherokee Nation wrote a letter to Congress. In it, he wrote that the majority of Cherokees, over 15,000, opposed the treaty. Ross attacked the treaty on all fronts, saying it was a pretended treaty and that the agreement was not legitimate because it was not supported by the majority of the nation. He gives reasons against removing Cherokee people to Indian territory, defends himself against various accusations, especially those made by John F. Schmemmerhorn, a U.S. commissioner, uh, Ross followed up his letter with the memorial of protest, which was dated June 21st, 
The memorial outlined the history of agreements between the U.S. and Cherokees in objection to activities of Georgia against the Cherokee Nation and people. It offered significant evidence of oppression and mistreatment as evidence of Georgia's overstepping its legitimate authority. But in the end, right, be, being right in all these letters, it just wouldn't change anything, sadly. We'll check back in with the Cherokee in 1838. Right now, the creek are being removed. During the creek removal of 1836, Chief Ania Miko and his people are chained and forced march from East Alabama to Montgomery. Another trail of tears. One observer remarked that it moved the stoutest heart to see a once mighty people fettered and chained together, forced to depart from the land of their fathers into a country unknown to them. Meanwhile, the Seminoles still fighting. On June 2nd, 1837, Seminole leaders Osceola or Osceola, uh, Abi, Abiaka, and Koakachi, aka Chief Wildcat, great name, appear at a Seminole encampment near Fort Brooke around dawn. They persuade a group of Seminoles who are waiting to start their removal to disappear with them into the forest swamps or into the Florida swamps with supplies, food, and ammunition. A little over four months later, that October, Osceola's resistance will come to an end when U.S. General Thomas Jessup baits Osceola by waving a white flag, signifying surrender, inviting the Seminole to peace talks. Osceola, along with several other Seminole leaders, go to the peace talks, hoping for a beneficial arrangement. Instead, Osceola is captured at Fort Payton, transferred to Fort Marion near St. Augustine, Florida. So shady shit. Military strategy-wise, you know, I get why the U.S. government tricked foreign leaders like this, uh, but morally, how shitty, right? And if you don't think it's shitty, imagine anyone, you know, your nation has fought in recent memory doing this to one of your leaders. Like, even in war, there are rules of engagement, which is why there are war crimes. And here, the U.S. commits uh, some war crimes. Uh, Osceola, uh, last and final transfer in December of that year was to Fort Moultrie in South Carolina, where he was in prison for three months. He would remain in prison until his death on January 30th, 1838. He died from some kind of throat infection. While sick, he refused to be treated with the white man's medicine. Probably thought it was poison, right? Can't blame him. Uh, Osceola was given a proper military burial at Fort Moultrie, and then he was decapitated and his body studied by U.S. Army Surgeon Frederick Whedon, so maybe not the most respectful burial. With uh, Osceola in prison and then dead, the U.S. was confident their war with the Seminoles would end. No, other Seminole leaders stepped up and just kept the battle going for quite a while longer. On December 25th, 1837, the Battle of Okeechobee, or Okeechobee takes place. It was the largest, bloodiest battle of the Second Seminole War, fought between 800 troops of the 1st, 4th, and 6th Infantry Regiments and 132 Missouri Volunteers under the command of General Zachary Taylor, and between 380 and 480 Seminoles led by Billy Bowlegs, uh, Abiyoka, or uh, Abiyaka, and Halpatter Tustanugi. Prior to this, Taylor was leading his troops down the K uh, Kissimmee River when they received word of the encampment. Taylor ordered a frontal assault as opposed to surrounding the hammock of dense trees and attacking. Uh, little did they know that the Seminoles had sensed their arrival and prepared for such an attack in preparation. The Seminoles had cut the grass short on the top of the hammock that overlooked the swampy area where they hid. This allowed for an unobstructed uh, firing lane. They also took advantage of the fact that the muck was so thick that soldiers and horses alike would sink into it, slowing down the enemy's movements. The initial Seminole fire sent Taylor's troops fleeing, but then Taylor was persistent, sending in rank after rank after rank of troops to attack. With Taylor's final infantry rank sent in, they were able to overtake the Seminoles and drive them away from the battlefield. Taylor then called in his reserve 1st Infantry to secure the area and claim victory. They just had way more men. One of the Americans' casualties, or of the Americans' casualties, 28 were killed, 112 wounded. Many of the wounded would die soon after uh, of injuries. The American press hailed it as a great victory, but in reality, the U.S. killed very few Seminole warriors. Only 12 bodies were recovered from their side. The vast majority escaped into the Everglades. The Seminoles drove their families and meager belongings deeper into the Everglades, where an estimated 300 of the original 3,000 would hide on remote islands for the next decade or longer. They refused to be relocated. I definitely admire their tenacity. Uh, 1837, the Chickasaws uh, do get re relocated. They leave their homes, settling on the western fringe of Choctaw-occupied lands in Indian Territory. The following year, the national debate over American Indian removal is reaching a fever pitch. Every day, Congress gets letters in support of American Indian removal, others condemning it. Most of the letters are focused around Cherokee lands, and in April, Congress decides to send federal troops in to prepare to remove the Cherokee. In May of 1838, the roundup begins. As the deadline for voluntary removal on May 23rd, 1838 approached, President Van Buren appoints General Winfield Scott to lead the forcible removal operation. Commanding some 7,000 troops, Scott arrives in Georgia on May 26, beginning a forcible evacuation at gunpoint. An estimated 17,000 Cherokee, along with about 2,000 black slaves, forced to move over the next three weeks. And at that time, the South suffers the worst drought in recorded history. 
The drought would last until 1841 with Charleston, Illinois, seeing temperatures that, re that reach 107 degrees, the hottest and uh, the hottest temperatures they would see until 1881. Huntsville, Alabama's driest year on record is still to this day, 1839. It was a real, real hot couple of dry, uh, dry summers. Uh, the drought would worsen the Cherokees already terribly uh, you know, or already terrible forced migration. In June of 1838, federal agents started accompanying Cherokee people from their homes in Georgia. The first of three detachments, totaling about 2,800 people, left on June 6 by steamboats and barges on the Tennessee River at present-day Chattanooga, Tennessee. The other two groups will soon follow. The marches begin on August 28, 1838. Head Chief John Ross agrees to lead the Cherokee to Oklahoma. The infamous Trail of Tears has begun for the Cherokee. Having been, in, having been held in miserable internment camps for days or weeks before their journeys begin, many of them start the trip ill. Some of them die before the journey starts as far as the march portion. Uh, even if they're not sick, you know, they're terribly unprepared for such a long journey. Very awful. Even many of those rounding them up were disgusted by the Trail of Tears. Private John G. Burnett, 2nd Regiment, 2nd Brigade, Mounted Infantry, would later write, I saw the helpless Cherokees arrested and dragged from their homes and driven at the bayonet point into the stockades. And in the chill of a drizzling rain on an October morning, I saw them loaded like cattle or sheep into 645 wagons and started toward the west. On the morning of November the 17th, we encountered a terrific sleet and snowstorm with freezing temperatures. And from that day until we reached the end of the fateful journey on March the 26th, 1839, the sufferings of the Cherokee were awful. The trail of the exiles was a trail of death. They had to sleep in the wagons and on the ground without fire. And I have known as many as 22 of them to die in one night of pneumonia due to ill treatment, cold, and exposure. My God, 22 in one night. Why wasn't a better way of resolving all of this reached? Well, because the U.S. government did not see the tribes as equals in the sense they did not view them as civilized human beings. They saw them as savages. Organized into detachments of 700 to 1,600 people, uh, each was headed by a conductor and an assistant appointed by Chief John Ross. The marches began on August 28, 1838, consisting of 13 groups. Under the guns of federal troops and Georgia State Militia, the Cherokee tribe makes their trek to the dry plains across the Mississippi, walking over 800 miles to Oklahoma. Walking over 800 miles. My God. Most commonly used overland uh, route followed a northern alignment, while other detachments followed more southern routes and other slight variations. Northern route began in Tennessee, crossed southwestern Kentucky and southern Illinois. After crossing the Mississippi River, north of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, these detachments trekked across southern Missouri and the northwest corner of Arkansas before arriving in Oklahoma near present-day Westville. Scholars estimate that between four and 5,000 Cherokees, including Ross's wife, Quady, uh, died on this journey. Man, they marched to death. All the, all the, uh, though the federal government officially stated only 424 deaths, an American doctor traveling with one, of the, uh, with one party estimated that at least 2,000 people died in the camps and another 2,000 along the trail. Other estimates have been stated that conclude that almost 8,000 of the Cherokees died during the Trail of Tears. As they crossed southern Illinois on December 26, Martin Davis, commissary agent for Moses Daniels Detachment, wrote, There is the coldest weather in Illinois I have ever experienced anywhere. The streams are all frozen over something like 8 or 12 inches thick. We are compelled to cut through the ice to get water for ourselves and animals. It snows here every two or three days at the farthest. We are now camped in Mississippi Swamp, four miles from the river, and there is no possible chance of crossing the river for the numerous quantity of ice that comes floating down the river every day. We have only traveled 65 miles on the last month, including the time spent at this place, which has been about three weeks. It is unknown when we, when we shall cross the river. A volunteer soldier from Georgia who participated in the removal recounted, I fought through the Civil War and have seen men shot to pieces and slaughtered by the thousands, but the Cherokee removal was the cruelest work I ever knew. Damn. The best written source we have regarding how terrible the march was are the memoirs of Samuel Cloud, who was nine years old when he traveled the Trail of Tears. His great-great-grandson would document his story for others to hear. So glad he did. This is seriously powerful shit. The most powerful testimony of this episode, I think, by leaps and bounds. So this is, uh, this is his story. This is what I remember. It is the bits and pieces of the memories of a young boy, full of feelings and observations, but without complete comprehension. The boy is my great-great-grandfather, Samuel Cloud. The memory is from his vantage point so I will share it with you in the same way. It is spring. The leaves are on the trees. 
I am playing with my friends when white men in uniforms ride up to our home. My mother calls me. I can tell by her voice that something is wrong. Some of the men ride off. My mother tells me to gather my things, but the men don't allow us time to get anything. They enter our home and begin knocking over pottery and looking into everything. My mother and I are taken by several men to where their horses are and are held there at gunpoint. The men who rode off return with my father, Elijah. They have taken his rifle and he is walking toward us. I can feel his anger and frustration. There is nothing he can do. From my mother, I feel fear. I am filled with fear, too. What is going on? I was just playing, but now my family and my, fam and my friends' families are gathered together and told to walk to the point of a bayonet. We walk a long ways. My mother does not let me get far from her. My father is walking by the other men, talking in low, angry tones. The soldiers look weary, as though they'd rather be anywhere else but here. They lead us to a stockade. They herd us into this pen like we are cattle. No one was given time to gather any possessions. The nights are still cold in the mountains, and we do not have enough blankets to go around. My mother holds me at night to keep me warm. That is the only time I feel safe. I feel her pull to I feel her pull me to her tightly. I feel her warm breath in my hair. I feel her softness as I fall asleep at night. As the days pass, more and more of our people are herded into the stockade. I see other members of my clan. We children try to play, but the elders around us are anxious and we do not know what to think. I often sit and watch the others around me. I observe the guards. I try not to think about my hunger. I am cold. Several months have passed and we are still in the stockades. My father looks tired. He talks with the other men, but no one seems to know what to do or what is going to happen. We hear that white men have moved into our homes and are farming our fields. What will happen to us? We are to march west to join the western Cherokees. I don't want to leave these mountains. My mother, my aunts, my uncles take me aside one day. Your father died last night, they tell me. My mother and my father's clan members are crying, but I do not understand what this means. I saw him yesterday. He was sick, but still alive. It doesn't seem real. Nothing seems real. I don't know what any of this means. It seems like yesterday I was playing with my friends. It is now fall. It seems like forever since I was clean. The stockade is nothing but mud. In the morning it is stiff with frost. By mid-afternoon it is soft and we are all covered in it. The soldiers suddenly tell us we are to follow them. We are led out of the stockade. The guards all have guns and are watching us closely. We walk. My mother keeps me close to her. I am allowed to walk with my uncle or an aunt occasionally. We walk across the frozen earth. Nothing seems right anymore. The cold seeps through my clothes. I wish I had a blanket. I remember last winter I had a blanket when I was warm. I don't feel like I'll ever be warm again. I remember my father's smile. It seems like so long ago. We walked for many days. I don't know how long it had been since we left our home, but the mountains are behind us. Each day we start walking a little later. They bury the dead in shallow graves because the ground is frozen. As we walk past white towns, the whites come out to watch us pass. No words are spoken to them. No words are said to us. Still, I wish they would stop staring. I wish it were them walking in this misery and I were watching them. It is because of them that we are walking. I don't understand why, but I know that much. They made us leave our homes. They made us walk to this new place we are headed in the middle of winter. I do not like these people. Still, they stare at me as I walk past. We come to a big river bigger than I have ever seen before. It is flowing with ice. The soldiers are not happy. We set camp and wait. We are cold in the snow and ice seem to hound us, claiming our people one by one. North is the color of blue, defeat and trouble. From there a chill wind blows for us as we wait by a frozen river. We wait to die. My mother is coughing now. She looks worn. Her hands and face are burning hot. My aunts and uncles try to take care of me so she can get better. I don't want to leave her alone. I just want to sit with her. I want to, her to stroke my hair like she used to do. My aunts try to get me to sleep by them, but at night I creep to her side. She coughs and it racks her whole body. When she feels me by her side, she opens her blanket and lets me in. I nestle against her feverish body. I can make it another day I know because she is here. When I went to sleep last night, my mother was hot and coughing worse than usual. When I woke up, she was cold. I tried to wake her up, but she lay there. The soft warmth she once was, she is no more. I kept touching her as hot tears streamed down my face. She couldn't leave me. She wouldn't leave me. I hear myself call her name softly, then louder. She does not answer. My aunt and uncle come over to me to see what is wrong. My aunt looks at my mother. My uncle pulls me from her. My aunt begins to wail. I will never forget that wail. 
I did not understand when my father died. My mother's death I do not understand, but I suddenly know that I am alone. My clan will take care of me, but I will be forever denied her warmth, the soft fingers in my hair, her gentle breath as we slept. I am alone. I want to cry. I want to scream in rage. I can do nothing. We bury her in a shallow grave by the road. I will never forget that lonesome hill of stone that is her final bed as it fades from my sight. I tread softly by my uncle, by my hand in his. I walk with my head turned, watching that small hill as it fades from my sight. The soldiers make us continue walking. My uncle talks to me, trying to comfort me. I walk in loneliness. I know what it is to hate. I hate those white soldiers who took us from our home. I hate the soldiers who make us keep walking through the snow and ice towards this new home that none of us ever wanted. I hate the people who killed my father and mother. I hate the white people who lined the roads in their woolen clothes that kept them warm watching us pass. None of those white people are here to say they are sorry that I am alone. None of them care about me or my people. All they ever saw was the color of our skin. All I see is the color of theirs, and I hate them. Fuck. Powerful, right? And that is one of thousands of other stories that are just as sad. And also unnecessary. They didn't need to be removed. Coexistence could have been achieved. Segregation and isolation was the path chosen instead, and it was a wrong path. Instead of being welcome to sit down and have a place at the white man's table, they were given a separate, much smaller, shittier table. When those who marched finally reached Oklahoma, the groups were often met by U.S. troops for Fort Gibson and the Arkansas River. Uh, most of the Cherokee who marched went to live near present-day Tahlequah, Oklahoma, where other Cherokee had voluntarily settled a few years before. Problems quickly developed among the new arrivals and those Cherokee who had already settled. People were understandably angry with the Cherokee delegates who'd signed the Treaty of New Echota. They blamed the signers for the deaths they'd suffered on the Trail of Tears and the signing away of Cherokee lands. In June 1839, Major Ridge, his son John, and nephew Elias Boudinot, those who had signed the Treaty of New Echota, were executed in accordance with the Cherokee blood law by John Ross's supporters. And then the Cherokee got busy adapting to their new homeland, reestablishing their own system of government. In late 1839, the Kickapoo and Kansas were removed to Indian Territory as well. And, uh, and I skipped past it the first time, but I can't not acknowledge it again. Uh, Kickapoo. Whew, the name does not translate well into English. A little better than punt a shit or punch a turd, but, you know, still not great. On January 15th, 1838, the Treaty of Buffalo Creek paves the way for federal agents to remove the Seneca tribe from New York to Kansas. On May 10th, 1842, uh, President John Tyler declares the Second Seminole War over. No treaty was signed, though. The following year, 1840, uh, 1843, the... Wyandotte tribe is removed from Ohio. The Sac and Fox tribes of Ohio or of Iowa follow. A group of Sac and Fox people would actually put up a fight like the Seminoles. Led by leader Blackhawk, this group resisted removal from Illinois, but after several bloody encounters with state militiamen, they are forced to resettle in Iowa, then part of Indian Territory. In 1846, federal agents removed the Miami tribe from Indiana. By this time, there were Creek, Seminole, and Chickasaw all living in the southern part of Indian Territory. In Indian Territory, the Southeastern American Indians established tribal governments, planted crops, founded new schools, customs of daily life, religions, and cultural traditions were transplanted from the Eastern homes and adapted to the new setting. But by the 1840s, numerous tribes in the Northeast and the Northwest Territory, including the Kickapoo, Miami, Delaware, and Shawnee, were removed into the Northern part now, present, uh, present Kansas. The U.S. government settled the tribes within the hunting areas of other tribes, often placing them near their traditional enemies without regard to the conflicts that would arise. The warlike Osages, uh, the Kiowas, the Comanches, for example, were especially vigorous in attacking newcomers from the east. Uh, Creeks and Seminoles disagreed on treatment of African-American slaves brought with them. Old hostilities were rekindled between Choctaws and Chickasaws. Boundary disputes arose between the Creek and Cherokees. Divisions among the Cherokees were especially bitter. The government established military posts throughout the territory to try and end the fighting and establish and maintain peace among the tribes. Then also in the 1840s, the United States would expand dramatically. Texas was annexed in 1845. Oregon Territory acquired from Great Britain in 1846. Uh, Mexico ceded a large area of land to the U.S. in 1848. The U.S. now stretched the Pacific Ocean. Indian Territory was suddenly in the middle of the nation, not on its far edge. Not good for the tribes yet again. The U.S. government would start re uh, re redesigning and shrinking Indian Territory to accommodate new interests. On February 27, 1851, the Indian Appropriations Act consolidated Western tribes into various agricultural reservations to help white settlers migrate westward. It also enabled the Transcontinental Railroad to cross to the Pacific Ocean. On May 30, 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act organizes Kansas Territory. The Upper and Lower Brazos Reservation is created in northern Texas for a multitude of different tribes. 
The following year, in 1855, the Seminoles start fighting again. On December 20th, 1855, Seminoles led by Billy Bowlegs attack a camp of U.S. Army surveyors in the Everglades. The third Seminole War has begun. After an Army surveying crew found and destroyed a Seminole plantation west of the Everglades in December of 1855, Chief Billy Bowlegs led a raid near Fort Myers. Right, the Third Seminole War would be mostly raids and payback raids, no large battles. The Americans adopted a strategy of destroying the Seminoles' food supplies, and by 1858, most of the remaining Seminoles, weary of war and facing starvation, agreed to be sent to Oklahoma in exchange uh, for promises of safe passage and cash payments. However, an estimated 500 Seminoles still refused to leave and retreated deeper into the Everglades. They made homes in the Big Cypress Swamp on lands that white settlers didn't want. And between the 1860s and 1890s, Seminoles and whites began uh, to trade peacefully along the borders of the Everglades. Uh, besides white traders, the Seminoles had contact with very few non-Seminoles, preferring to hunt, farm, and live isolated in the Everglades. They fucking did it. They held on to their traditional way of life for several additional decades. Pretty damn impressive. At the last holdouts. In 1865, the Treaty of Little Arkansas River assigned reservations to Cheyenne, Arapaho, uh, Kiowa, and Comanche in Western Indian Territory. More treaties follow. Once again, as settlers made their way west, the U.S. government was looking to shrink Indian territory. In 1866, treaties reduced the land holdings of the five civilized tribes. Between 1867 and the 1880s, more and more tribes would be relocated all over the growing nation. 1880 sees the start of the boomer movement. It's nothing to do with people my age and older not understanding technology. Uh, check this ridiculous shit out. It was the brainchild of David L. Payne who campaigned to open unassigned lands in central Indian territory for white settlement. Payne's plan was to charge a small fee for membership in this Oklahoma colony. During the next four years, he and his followers made eight attempts to settle the region. Soldiers kicked them out every time. Then in 1884, when David Payne dies in Wellington, Kansas, his second command, William Couch, takes over, and Couch leads an expedition into Indian Territory, also kicked out by the military. But then he bitches to Congress a whole bunch about it. And on April 22nd, 1889, Congress is like, ah, fuck it. Just let white settlers just in the last place that they're, you know, weren't supposed to go like like the one place they had uh you know all fucking moved to because whites didn't want you know to live by them now it's opened up to white settlement right ain't that a bitch again the reservation plan just not a good plan some white settlers uh called sooners had already entered the territory illegally had established farms and more and more were to come after congress opened things up legally at noon on April 22nd, thousands of white men, women, and children on horseback and wagons and on foot rush into the interior of the former Indian territory to stake out their homesteads, to take what little land the tribes had left. My God, how fucking furious are you if your ancestors had traveled the Trail of Tears just a few decades back and now this shit's happening? Uh, March of 1889, a new law for the first time specified enclosed boundaries for the Indian territory, now officially reduced to an area bounded by Texas on the south, Arkansas and Missouri on the east, Kansas on the north, and New Mexico Territory on the west. Soon this area was reduced again when Oklahoma Territory is created from part of it by the Organic Act in May of 1890. A governor is appointed, a two-house territorial assembly, and a judicial system is set up. Now a bona fide territory of the U.S. Oklahoma Territory will be eligible for statehood if its population grows large enough and if its leaders follow the process prescribed by federal law. And then the Oklahoma Territory Organic Act even more closely defines Indian ter Territory, reducing it to slightly more than the eastern half of the present state. It just keeps getting smaller every couple of years. In 1891, Sac and Fox lands are opened up for settlement. In 1892, the same happens to the Cheyenne and Arapaho lands. 1893, it's open season on Cherokee land. Uh, around 100,000 people make a run for the Oklahoma for Oklahoma homesteads. Uh, the Curtis Act goes into effect on June 28, 1898. It results in the breakup of tribal governments and communal lands in Indian Territory. And then on November 16th, 1907, Oklahoma becomes the 46th state. And Indian Territory is gone for good. Reservations remain, but it's not the same. And then jumping way ahead now to 1987, about 2,200 miles of trails were authorized by federal law to mark the removal of 17 detachments of the Cherokee people. So many miles of trails, so many people died marching on. Called the Trail of Tears National Historic Trails, it traverses portions of nine states and includes land and water routes. And with that... Let's hop out of that big ass time suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. I know those were a lot of details. Uh, cut out a whole bunch more, actually. But the, the ones left in just felt like, ah, the story wouldn't be properly conveyed without it. Uh, yeah, no one's going to be tested. 
Uh, the history of American Indians in this country, man, so much broader than we even covered here today. Some of it we covered in our Navajo Code Talkers Tuck, uh, Code Talkers Suck. We talked about the plans that the U.S. government wanted to make to assimilate American Indians into American society. One example being, horrifyingly, the boarding school system where young American Indians were basically bullied out of speaking their native tongues. Uh, such a tragedy, the Trail of Tears, another tragedy, many tragedies, so many forced moves. Between 1788 and 1871, 368 treaties were signed between various tribes and the U.S. government. Just about every single one of them, you know, reduced land holdings. Uh, these treaties were based on the fundamental idea that each tribe was an independent nation with their own right to self-determination and self-rule, but that was never actually true. They were never independent. They were subjugated. You know, they, so why pretend they had auton autonomy? I mean, what a silly game just to constantly try and appease them a little bit, a little bit. Seems to be true to me is that 368 times the U.S. government just kicked the problem of how to truly assimilate with the tribes down the road a little further to deal with later. They placated the tribes over and over again. Just take a little more here, a little more there, on and on and on. Treaties would be signed and white settlers would inevitably want the lands allocated in those treaties for themselves. And then more treaties would be signed and then more settlers would want those lands and new treaties would be signed, et cetera, et cetera. So many broken promises. And many of those broken promises ended in some long death marches that led to still more broken promises. Tribes were forced to live hundreds of miles away from where their ancestors had lived and to neighbor with other tribes they often had little in common with. They didn't speak the same languages, have the same customs. Sometimes they were forced to live next to tribes they'd you know, battled with. Then not long after being marched into Indian Territory, white settlers wanted that too. And in 1907, Indian Territory became the state of Oklahoma. Couldn't we have done things differently? We sure could have. Men like Davy Crockett wanted to. Men no more educated than Andrew Jackson, who had also fought the tribes, you know, were opposed to all of this. Many were opposed to it. So why did we do what we did? Uh, because it seems the majority of Americans saw natives as less than uh, them, you know, simply because they were native. And what can we learn from that? Well, to stop doing that same shit to other people. These attitudes still exist today. You know, stop Asian hate is currently a movement. Why? Because hate crimes are still a thing because some people still hate other people based on their race. It's just it's so fucking ignorant. You know, how sad. Why would anyone hate Asians for being Asians? It's just as stupid as hating natives for being native. You know, hate crimes are so preposterously ignorant. What a sad person you're choosing to be if you commit them. And that's really what the Trail of Tears was, a big fucking hate crime. One sanctioned by the government. Thankfully, our government no longer sanctions crimes like these, at least not at the moment. Different is not always less than. It usually is not. My way or your way isn't always the best way, and it's rarely the uh, only way. You know, any other thoughts I can share right now on those would probably just be uh, redundant. Thoughts I'd already shared earlier. So let's get on out of here. A few more looks back at the infamous Trail of Tears in today's Top 5 Takeaways. Time suck. Top 5 Takeaways. Number one, the term the Trail of Tears typically refers to the march undertaken by the Cherokee Nation in 1838 and 1839 when they were forced at gunpoint to move from Georgia to Oklahoma. But it can also refer to a whole bunch of forced displacements that took or that went on be, from 1831, excuse me, all the way to 1877. Number two, the Seminoles stand out today for their various attempts to repel Europeans and later Americans. Americans fought the Seminoles for decades through three wars and eventually uh, had to give up fighting them. After all that, a couple hundred still lived their traditional lives in the Everglades. And that is why the Seminoles of Florida today call themselves the unconquered people. Number three, Andrew Jackson may have been Mr. Badass when it came to American democracy, but his policy of Indian removal is embarrassing by today's standards and really embarrassing by the standards of its own time. You know, if he, he should have listened to Crockett, Davy, Davy Crockett, listen to when that guy talks, you know, when it came to native relations. Uh, number four, sorry, swamp horses are not real. Holy shit, that would be awesome. Number five, new info, uh, kind of. I have reason to believe my dad may have been one of the guards forcing families to march to their deaths during the Trail of Tears. No one knows where he was in 1838 or 1839. He refused to take my questions about it seriously. He just spews out some bullshit about not being alive yet. Mm hmm Convenient. No, but uh, kind of new-ish info now. Uh, almost entirely forgotten in the narrative of the Trail of Tears is the story of the thousands of African slaves who also marched. I briefly mentioned that earlier, and I wanted to go further into it now. When the tribes were forced to march from their ancestral homelands, thousands of black slaves owned by tribal members also were removed and forced to provide manual labor along the way and march with them. And they weren't just like also sent out because they happened to be black and they just wanted to get them to Oklahoma. They were actually, you know, uh, tribal slaves. How fucking crazy is that? I only learned that doing some deep digging right before recording this episode. You have to really look for that info. Once in Oklahoma, these slaves often toiled on plantation-style farms or were servants in tribal members' homes. 
So while the tribes were being mistreated and exploited, you know, based largely on the color of their skin, many of them were mistreating and exploiting other people for the same fucking reasons. Is that irony? It feels like some pretty fucked up irony. Uh, today, thousands of descendants of those black slaves, known as freedmen, are still fighting to be recognized by the tribes that once owned their ancestors. Today, the Cherokee Nation is the only one of the five civilized tribes that fully recognizes the freedmen as full tribal citizens. And they only came to this recognition in 2017, after years of litigation. Seminole freedmen say they are still unable to receive services other tribal citizens get, including health care, tribal license plates, housing subsidies. And many of these Seminole freedmen are direct descendants of freed black slaves who joined the Seminoles in Florida during the wars against the U.S. government we talked about. And why won't the tribe recognize them today? Why? Don't know. Come on, humanity. What the fuck is wrong with so many of us? It's actually so easy just to not be an asshole. But so many of us are just so dogged in their, our, our determination to just not make that choice. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The Trail of Tears has been sucked. Sorry, my mush mouth was a little more out of hand than normal today. I don't know what was going on. You know, it has a, has a mind of its own. I can't, I can't depend on it. Depend on it. E, my God. All day. Not just recording, just trying to talk to people. It's been mushier than ever. Uh, but what a big unnecessary tragedy, right? One of many we humans have made, a piece of history I'm surprised I knew so little about before this week. I'm glad I know it now. Uh, I, I often wonder when I was younger, I'm like, well, how did everybody get to Oklahoma? Like why there, what exactly went on? And now I just, you know, it was nice to see it in the context of all these treaties and just the, the history there. Uh, hope you, hope you learned a lot. Thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for all the help in making Time Suck this week and every week. Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, the artist formerly known as Micropene, the script keeper, Zach Flannery, Sophie Fax Sorceress Evans, Bid Elixir, Logan Art Warlock, Keith running BadMagicMerch.com and working on the socials along with Liz Hernandez, who also admins the current Cult of the Curious private Facebook group with the help of her all-seeing eyes. Uh, thanks to Beefsteak and the Mod Squad on Discord. Next week on Time Suck, thanks to the Always Curious Spaces, it's voting in another good topic. We're going to investigate ancient humanity and some of their greatest architectural achievements. We're going to suck the seven ancient wonders of the world. Can you name all seven? I think I only got two. I tried. After the suck, you'll know them all. The Great Pyramid at Giza is one. That's one of the ones I got. Uh, the Hanging Garden of Babylon is another. Forgot about that one. Uh, Stonehenge, Great Wall of China, surprisingly not on the list. This is because the credited authors of the seven wonders of the world were all Mediterranean men. And they didn't know much about the world outside of that region, which is fair. Now, people weren't traveling as much back then. Uh, many of the well-known seven ancient wonders are testaments to classic Greek architecture and their devotion to the Greek pantheon of gods. So yeah, a lot of Greek words for me to fuck up next week. Uh, we'll also take this opportunity to look into other wonders of the world. At the turn of the 21st century, millions of people voted for a new seven wonders of the world. What made that list? I'm lucky enough to have been to a few of them. Uh, what are the most amazing natural wonders of the world or the most incredible modern mega projects that Meat Sacks have been constructing lately? Who is today's leading nation in man-made wonders? So much wonder. Lots of wonder. Fucking wonder next week. Uh, the seven wonders of the ancient world and more. And now let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. First up, uh... A nifty little update to the U.S. crazy law suck. Environmentally knowledgeable, smart sucker, Andrew Kirk writes, Hey, suck master. During the crazy U.S. law suck, you covered Alabama's confetti regulation, and it is really not all that crazy of a law. As an aquatic biologist who has done work on toxic chemicals, I can see legitimate reasons for banning plastic confetti among other single-use plastics. Plastic confetti can become widely dispersed in the environment and can make its way into waterways quite easily with just a little rain. Once there, it can settle into the sediment where bottom-feeding bugs and fish ingest it. Probably swamp horses do. These organisms are then eaten by later organisms, which can have an exponentially higher amount of plastics in their systems as they eat lots of smaller organisms with little bits of plastic in them. Now let's bump it up another level in the food web and imagine birds of prey and humans ingesting it, and the levels of plastics are even higher. The residence time of microplastics in an organism is short, but it can still cause major issues for whatever consumes it and act as a binding agent for other toxic chemicals to tag along into an organism, thereby causing even more health issues. You can do a search for microplastics effects and find a whole slew of impacts. So a big yuck to that. Honestly, whatever steps we can take to use biodegradable alternatives to plastics, the better, assuming, assuming what they degrade to isn't some nasty shit either. Also, we may not be, uh, oh, sorry. Also, we may be brothers. We share the same birthday, I bet. 
Your dad cannot verify his whereabouts in the late 1980s. Sure can't. About nine months prior to my birth, I get it, highly suspicious. Sorry about what my dad may have done with your family. Not sorry for the long email. I cannot wait for you to come back to Richmond, Virginia to laugh my ass off. Hopefully you've been working on your it's raining from the ceiling in the middle of a comedy show material as last time was pretty weak. That was so crazy. That storm during the show. And my soon-to-be wife and I love watching Is We Dumb. Yay! Every Wednesday night and it has often helped us get over a sucky day at work or life. All the best, Andrew. Well, Andrew, thank you. Uh, thank you for that info and happy belated birthday. You've sold me. The confetti law. Okay, actually not crazy. Solid logic there. Uh, I would rather not have a bunch of plastic in my gut. I have, I have enough unpleasant shit in there already. Uh, looking forward to seeing you at another show. Hopefully it doesn't rain again. Uh, now for a Cummins Law victim. Oh, this is a uh, poor guy. Barbecue maestro Jacob Lubbers just had a Bluetooth situation that may have cost him a lot of money. Uh, maybe me promoting his business can now help him gain some lost profits back. Jacob writes, master of Bojangles and Lord of Sucking. You've really done it this time. You have shocked a Southern Baptist to the point he is likely still praying for forgiveness for even hearing such filth. My side hustle, which is becoming more of a real thing, is barbecue. Is a barbecue company. I started when our competition team, Full Bore Barbecue, started doing really well, and I decided to start selling our spices, spices and sauces uh, in retail while sitting at home during COVID. What started in nine stores and online with three spices has now expanded to well over 200 stores, online sales, five spices, and three sauces in less than a year. Fuck yeah. Everything was blown up and doing great. And then you got involved. Oh, okay. I've been working for about six months on a large retail deal with a grocery chain called Schnucks, if anyone is familiar. Finally, after months of negotiations and paperwork, I get a six-store trial with them in the Evansville, Indiana area. The buyer I work with is originally a devout Baptist from Georgia. As I live in Knoxville, Tennessee, I'm familiar with the type, and things were finally going great. I was making my initial deliveries in person to these six stores last week and decided to put on the old Chapo suck while I drove. I planned to, the, to end of the store the buyer was at that day. Thank you for business and taking to lunch. All the deliveries were made. My stuff was on the shelf. We were headed to my car, parked out back by the receiving area. We were standing, talking to another store employee before we left about 10 feet from the car. And since it was about 75, 80 degrees, I decided to hit the remote start and get the car cooled down before hopping in. Everything was fine. The audio doesn't start until the key fob is close enough, I suppose. When we were about five feet from the car, the podcast hit. And boy, did the timing take this fellow for a ride. The first thing he heard was, are you feeling high yet, Jamal? Hell yeah. I want to fuck some white women and kill some cops. <laughs> well, the buyer suddenly got a, quote, phone call that instantly prohibited him from having a free lunch. So you tell me how he felt. Potentially have lost out on getting my stuff into the rest of his huge chain, depending on how he feels about that. But, oh, well, I'll continue to listen. <laughs> If you are in the Evansville, Indiana area, please go to Schnucks and buy all the full bore barbecue stuff you can find. And let's see if we can salvage this thing. Humbly yours, Jacob Lovers, owner, CEO, full bore barbecue, full bore barbecue products.com. Oh shit. Come on, time suckers in Indiana. Go to Schnucks. Buy this poor bastard's full bore barbecue. Oh man. Sorry, Jacob. Any of you time suckers running stores that need a awesome full bore barbecue sauce, well, get some. I bet if you threw Jacob a Hail Nimrod, uh, you know, at fullborebarbecueproducts.com, you could get a sweet deal. Sounds like schnucks. Sounds like they might be out. I, I hope not. You know, you have that guy listen to last week's uh, Carl Denke suck, Jacob. Then, then assure him that your barbecue sauce is so good, it could even make Denke's man meat delicious. Even make his pickled pork tasty. His pickled man pork. I'm sure that'll win him over. Sorry about that. <laughs> but it is funny. For everyone but you. Another U.S. Crazy Laws update now coming in from law enforcing sucker, dear, uh, uh, sorry, law enforcing sucker, Brandon, uh, sharing a crazy law he had to deal with in Maine. Brandon writes, dear master sucker, first, I grew up in the Merrimack Valley and did not know until today that all the premarital sex I had in Massachusetts from 2000 to 2007 were crimes. Uh, they still let me be a cop after that. Guess it was because I wasn't as tall as Ed Kemper. Nice. Uh, second, when you talked about the Alaskan drinking law, I thought of Maine's drinking laws that I had to work with as both a cop and later as a bouncer. Maine has a law that no one can be visibly intoxicated in a bar or the bar and bar staff can be fined. As a bouncer, this was infuriating at times because it was like, let them get drunk, but not too drunk. Though some are easy to call, others would get cited for uh, stuff that would be completely arbitrary. Another is no performer can drink on stage in Maine because at that time they count as an employee. 
The funny story behind this one is one year during the St. Patrick's Day, it was an Irish bar and a club, so 23-hour day for bouncers. We spotted a liquor enforcement officer and told the two career alcoholic musicians they absolutely could not drink on stage. Myself and other bouncers then wound up in a fight that spilled outside where two idiots that were originally victims in a fight attacked police because they had warrants. While inside, filling out the police report in the office, I looked up at the monitor, seeing dumbass and dimwit take shots on stage mid-set, two feet from the liquor enforcement officer saying, fuck the rules at St. Patty's. We got huge fines, had to be super strict with all performers from that point on, which really sucked. Uh, well, not sorry for the long email. Long time listener of Time Suck and huge fan of your comedy. Was bummed last year that COVID fucked up a senior in Boston. Love the show, wouldn't change a thing. Three out of five stars, Brandon. Well, thank you, Brandon. Man, what a couple of dumb lots. Right? Let the people get drunk in the bars. Let the performers get drunk on stage. You know what? In a bar, fucking let everyone get drunk on like in, in there. Who gives a shit? Like legally. Why can't like bartenders, wait staff? It shouldn't fucking matter who, who can drink. Right? They don't need to get punished legally. If they get drunk enough and they're sloppy and fucking things up left and right, well then they'll lose their business. And that'll be plenty of punishment enough. The market will regulate itself there. Too much regulation. Also love that you called those two musicians uh dumbass and dimwit. And I love for some reason the idea of you just like doing paperwork after like a huge brawl. Like that's just like your job. Like how, how was job? Oh, you know, it was, it was, it was work. You know, it was okay. You know, I, uh, I got in two huge fights and, uh, you know, it's kind of sucked. I had to do a bunch of paperwork. There's something weird about that to me. Where, like I, I picture like blood in your knuckles. Then you're just like casually just like, you know, writing paperwork out. Like this guy fucking punched me. So I had to fucking crush his face. And this guy was a dickhead. And I had to fucking kick him in the fucking nuts. And then, you know, uppercut him in the stomach and then throw him over a wall. <laughs> I'll move on now. Another crazy U.S. laws update coming in from thoughtful sack Thomas Carroll, who writes, Hey, Dan, I would come up with some weird nicknames, but we have serious business to attend to. I've been listening for years, never felt the need to write in, but I've spent a lot of time thinking about this one. And the crazy U.S. laws suck. You talked about how crazy it was for New Jersey to not pump their own gas. As someone that grew up in New Jersey, A, it's so weird to picture you tipping the gas attendant since I've never heard of anyone doing that, but hey, not a bad thing, I suppose. And B, I've always thought it was ridiculous that this law wasn't in all states. To address your cons first, as someone who grew up in Jersey, up until recently moving to California, I always felt extremely normal getting my gas pumped. It's not weird for anyone since that's the person's job. You pull up, hand them your card or cash, check your phone, making sure time suck is paused. That's nice. So when you turn your car back on, they don't make you the next Cummins law victim. But then you get your card back and keep it moving. As far as speed, yes, sometimes it's a bit faster, pumping your own gas, but we're talking three, four minutes extra if the place is crowded. My normal experience outside of super busy times is I'm in and out in similar amount of time as when I pump it myself. Now for my argument. Number one, jobs. I've had friends and family who worked at gas stations and they were happy with the money they made and the hours they picked. It's a low stress, simple job. And I've seen everyone from high school kids to people with mental disabilities. Please correct me if that's not the right wording. I think that's, yeah, developmental disabilities. Uh, all working the job and earning a paycheck. Imagine how many new jobs will be created. Google tells me that there are approximately 168,000 stations in the U.S. Take away 18,000 of those uh, currently with attendance, a guess, and multiply by four, how many people would be hired each on average? And we're looking at about 600,000 new jobs overnight with zero new infrastructure, all paid by big oil money if done correctly. If you're worried about the stations not being profitable because of new costs, we have a gas station every five feet in New Jersey, and they seem to be doing just fine. Number two, safety. As I said above, pumping gas is not rocket science, but I can imagine that a group of people who pump gas and know the machines they work are less likely to have that one in 1,000 accident versus a new person every time. I'm sure a study exists that either confirms or disputes that, but I can't find it. Also, it's cleaner to have one person handle the pump rather than multiple people every day. Also, I know my fiance feels safer at night at a low light station when she hands a worker a card versus getting out of the car herself. Anyway, I hope I brought you to the right side of history, even though all of this will be invalid when Elon takes over the world in 10 years. <laughs> Absolutely love what you and the team do. Keep on sucking best, Tommy. Well, thank you, Tommy. Uh, first, real quick, I guess it is weird that I tipped uh, gas station attendants. I've gotten other emails about that. I, I just didn't know it was normal. And then the first time it happened, I just, I, I thought I was supposed to do it. And then I just kept doing it. Uh, next, that is a lot of jobs created by big oil money, which I guess could be great. So I'll give you that. And I didn't think about some people not feeling safe. I like that part of it. I didn't think about some people not feeling safe, you know, like pumping their own gas, getting out of the car in some situations. So I like that benefit. So how about, uh, how about we meet halfway? What if gas stations all had to have some attendants who could pump your gas if you wanted them to, like in the right lane, like the gas station attendant line lane, or like the self-service, kind of like a grocery store. You can do like the regular checkout or you can do the self-checkout, right? Because, you know, control freaks like me, we just want to do that shit ourselves. 
Um, but if other people don't mind and it creates a ton, hundreds of thousands of extra jobs, well, why would I stand against that? So, okay, you sold me. Great message. You sold me halfway. Uh, one more quick crazy US laws update. Pinball wizard meets sack Oliver Bohemia writes, what up time suckers and or space lizards? I'm writing in to provide some context on some strange ass pinball laws covered in the latest time suck. The reason this legislation exists is because prohibition area, prohibition era mafia activity used pinball machines without paddles to skirt gambling laws. That's funny. Uh, states started banning machines to make illegal gambling a bit more difficult, at which point the paddles were added so it was no longer a game of chance. Hence why you might find laws specifically legalizing certain forms of pinball. Keep on sucking. Great info, okay? All right. Now that crazy law makes some sense. It was an anti-organized crime thing, not an anti-don't-let-the-kids-play-pinball thing. Uh, I would have never known that without your message. So thank you, Pinball Wizard. And now one last message, a plea for romance. Lucifina help this man. Smitten sucker, Jonathan Krebs writes, a few weeks ago, I met the woman of my dreams on a hike with a hiking group. Instead of getting her phone number, I gave her mine, put the ball in her court, and she's never called me. Oh, well, I must not have been the man of her dreams. Anyway, she told me about time suck, so at least I now have something to fill the emptiness I hadn't realized was in my life. I'm only through like episode 30, but I'm loving everyone. Thanks for all the suck and keep sucking. Well, mystery lady sucker, if you're listening to this, Right? Maybe you should give Jonathan a call. He sounds like a very nice guy and he's very interested. He's a lady of his dreams. He probably has the same fucked up sense of humor you do. You know, being able to laugh together is so important in a good relationship. So maybe give him a call. If you two, if you two do meet, let me know. And if you don't, uh, hopefully, you know, both of you can at least keep on sucking. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast, Meat Sacks. Uh, be nice this week. If you get a chance to talk to someone from a different culture, do it. Different can be good. And if you find a swamp horse, you fucking ride that son of a bitch. <laughs> JK, it'll kill you. Please don't. Stay away from gator steeds and keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. Yo, let's sing a little song for the end of this one. Okay. Which one are we singing? Is it Wet Ass Pussy by no. uh, uh, Cardi B? No, I was singing more like the Davy Crockett theme song. You know it. Come on. Hey, Once go, you hear it, you'll know it. Oh, okay, go ahead. Okay, here we um, go. Born on a mountaintop in Tennessee. Green estate and the land of the free. Raised in the woods so we knew every tree. Killed him a bear when he was only three. three. Davy, Davy Crockett. Okay. King of the wild frontier. Come on. Davy, Davy Crockett. King of the wild frontier. Woo! Woo! Nailed it. It's better than wet ass pussy. Slap it! <laughs>